Hey, welcome to the 10th Net That Whole Compass show of 21-22 season. I'm Nima and I'm joined by my co-host and fellow fantasy football hub writer, Hibbo. How are you, buddy? Not too bad. I think overnight I was sitting on 42 points for that game week and I've got double Brighton defence and play at the minute, so hoping they get back up near 100k, I think, by the close of the game week. But no, this is a very special episode and we're joined by Fantasy Football Hub contributor and we're going to call him YouTube Sensation. Hi, Daniels, a.k.a. FPL Tops. So, how are you, Harry? I'm very good, thank you. Thanks for having me on, guys. It's been a while since I've been watching you, so it's a pleasure to be to be joining you both. Pleasure's all ours, definitely. For sure. So, just before we get going, guys, I'm going to talk about the Mini League for anyone who's new to the show. It's nice to see a lot of new viewers over the last few weeks. Let me just put this up. There we go. Yeah, so the money league code, it's FG1XNB for anybody that wants to bounce in. Just to timestamp the episode for everybody. So Palace and Brighton's on play at the minute. And as it stands, we've got a fellow who's first place in the league, Ryan Quinn. He's on 485 points with an OR. He's 13th overall, believe it or not. So forget about Ned that hall. Go <laughs> one FPL, Ryan. That's what I say. That's crazy. Um, for- and for anybody watching on VOD, so if you're not watching live, if you have any kind of questions about your team moving forward to game week seven, leave a comment underneath the video and we'll definitely pick it up before the deadline. Sounds good. Um, so just to go into your OR then, Harry, it would be good to just talk a little bit about how you got into FPL in the first season in 2016, 2017. So I want to go right into it. And then at the end of the show, we can um, obviously get the live viewers questions as well. So Definitely share, guys. Help get the word out that we're live. Had a couple of technical issues going live, but we're live now. For the podcast viewers as well, I'm just going to quickly explain your last three years, Harry, and then let's hear about how you got going. So you came 3,800, 125K, and then 13,800. So that's obviously three great seasons, but tell us about how you begun because even your first year looks like a pretty good rank. Yeah, so I started off when I was younger before I started with these these seasons playing the telegraph one i sort of managed my dad's work league um so i managed him with my brother a little bit but my brother didn't take it nearly as seriously as i did um and started to started to look at it a little bit more um and then my barber where i got my hair cut like twice well i was gonna say twice a year no probably like once every couple of months for like (laughs) five six years said that he had a league so why not you know, go and come and join that. And that's when I did that first 2016, 2017 season, um, which was the year Josh King announced his, announced his himself on, on the scene when he was at Bournemouth. So that's how I got into it. It started off managing my dad's team and then I took it on my own. And the first, first season I went, it went well. And I just thought, well, well, let's keep going. So I yeah, just so- realized as well, Hibbo. I realized that I'd gone straight into it at the beginning, three minutes in, and I couldn't wait to get going with Harry. I didn't even wait for the guests to arrive. I saw the numbers were low, and I thought, let's just talk to Harry, and then we'll see the viewers come flocking. And Harry is working, we're almost up to double digits just <laughs> by getting you on. So let's keep going from here. To I reckon we can get to 40 50 live viewers tonight, and we'll see what happens. But yeah, let, let, let's go here. Let's get into the interview, as I was saying, nice and early. Yeah, so, back. so so kind of looking at last season, like you you came three thousand eight hundred nineteenth, and that was like it was your first time getting the top ten k finish, but it was it was really your first time getting the top five k finish as well. And when you think about the standard of the game at the minute and say eight million players, remarkable achievement. Like how did how did that feel to get the kind of monkey off your back? And <laughs> yeah, it was really good. It was one of those things that I feel like in my first season. So there's a story I tell. I was very close to getting a top the the very coveted top 10k finish in that first season and i in my first season there where i finished about 11k didn't really know that this top 10k thing was really what everyone desired so i'd won all my mini leagues by that final day of the season and i'm a big chelsea fan for anyone who doesn't know so i brought in and captained john terry when it was his final game for chelsea <laughs> Oh and he got God, taken off. I after, found out about you as well. Yeah, he got taken off after 17 minutes for one point. And if I'd have, well, it was my transfer to start with. But if I'd have captained anyone else in my team, I would have, I would have already had a top 10k finish. But it was nice to finally take it off. I feel like it's one of those things that now I've got it. I can, 
I can put it on my CV, go to all my jobs and tell future employees that I've now got this. It's nice to have done it. Oh, yeah, that's that's tragic. Yeah, it is. <laughs> as a Chelsea fan as well, double the pain. When yeah. your FPL team and your real life team both implode in the same week, it's never a good experience. That's why I try to avoid their assets. But mm. we'll be hearing a lot about Chelsea from you tonight, I'm sure, as well, when we get into it. So was there one thing I would say, Harry, that you did differently, do you think, that in the year that you did come top 5K compared to the year that you came 10.9? You obviously explained the John Terry decision and it was sentimental. So you learned from the bad decision, as you said. Yeah. You didn't know top 10K was good enough. That was your excuse. You were like, oh, I didn't know it was a great rank. I just had fun. You let sentiment get to you. And I, I, I love that because that's happened to me. And I've then rage transferred out my players from my club and then they scored a week after. Hmm. So it will be interesting to hear. Um, what was the one thing you would do differently that year, would you say? Because it was your fifth season, was it? So how did yeah. you get that top 5K, I guess? What was the one rule that you changed or element you had? So I started okay, but I played a sort of a game week six wildcard, which was when I brought in Kane and Son. And it was, you know, just as Kane and Son were really starting to be great. A lot of people owned one, but very few people owned both. So that got me to the sort of top, 50k come game week 10 and just from there on out last season was a very template season if you did if you're doing well and you owned the highly owned players it was very difficult to fall too far um which is what i did last last season so i, I ticked along very nicely and then i finished very well i didn't i played my chips very differently to a lot of people last season so a lot of people played sort of, I think, game week 18, 19, there was that blank double. A lot of people played their sort of triple captain or bench boost then. I didn't play a single chip. I didn't play my free hit or anything. So it came to sort of game week 25, 30, where everyone had, was slightly better than me. I was probably, I fell a little bit from 20K at the time to 50K. But I had all my chips left. I played my free hit in the triple game week, which gave me a sort of game week rank of about 25K, which finished me very well. So... I sort of looked and thought when, you know, there are best, you know, strategies we can follow to play your chips, but it is different for every team. And I just found something, I got quite lucky at times, you know, with those late wildcarders having leads when they got their match postponed and things like that. It all did fall into place a little bit. I can't say that I wasn't lucky. Um, but yeah, I'd say I started very well and then just ticked along quite nicely. What about like your kind of style of play? Do you, like, would you consider yourself to be kind of template? Um, I would say within reason, I think if there's a player that I can see doing well, I'm not afraid to go with them if that player is not completely maverick. So I brought, I brought Saar in game week four. He blanked against, um, I can't remember who it was. I think Leeds, no, Newcastle, one of the two, the game week four before he scored twice and no one really had him that week. And then he scored two the next week. So I'm not completely template. There were more template picks, but I would say that I tend to be slightly more conservative than I think I especially used to be. That's really interesting. Um, I guess for me, I am a patient manager, I would say, so I don't take many hits. And I think that's probably the hallmarks of people who can get consistently mediocre ranks like top 100K. And I've yeah. been doing that, but it's hard to get the top 10K and 5K and 1K. So I bet you're going to get one of those mugs soon where you start putting the ranks on. You got to start notch. I know Hibbo is trying to notch another one for his mug. I've already got a mug. <laughs> yeah, but you need to notch it with the next top. Thing, yeah, it's true. The next top rank you get is that how it works, Hibbo? I'm trying to do a PB. I think this year. I think that. I think that should always be your target. I think my best rank was four thousand four hundred and forty-three. So if I could beat that by one, I'd be happy. You know, but if I came top ten k, I'd be happy. But I, I always can. I'm in my head. I'm thinking I would love the PB this year. It's like a or ghost in a racing game. You're always trying oh. to beat your time trial. Big time. And order another cup off merch. Line merch's pocket. <laughs> in terms of hits then, Harry, so I guess in this patient approach that yeah. we were talking to you just before I went off on the tangent, like how many do you take, like say in general, and do you find you take them at different times of the season more often or for like say double game weeks? Like would you take one next week to protect a wild card out of interest? I don't necessarily have a particular rule of this is how many hits I want to take. I don't tend to take that many and I don't tend to take them very short term. I tend to take them if I want a player now that I think I'm going to keep for a long period of time. I've taken one this season. I would say I probably take a max of one every 
sort of three or four, probably one every four weeks. If you averaged out over the whole season, I can go weeks where I don't take them for a long time. Um, I try not to. I, I used to take them quite a lot. And I, the more I look at it, the more I think the chances of it paying off are just, I just think are so low. You've probably owned the player A in the first place because they do have a chance of returning that, yes, immediately you're unlikely to get it. So that's why I tend to look. If I'm bringing in a player that I think will outscore considerably over the next sort of four or five game weeks, then yeah, I might do it. But I just think they actually pay off much less than you probably think they would. It is a goal at the end of the day. Like you need your player to score to to make up that hit, let alone, you know, beat it. So, But one thing as well, um, at the end of the season, right, when it's all done and dusted, if you've got the same points as people, they give you the rank based on how many transfers you've done, right? It's so true, that's yeah. That's like another game within a game. That's crazy, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> just just to kind of, like, obviously you're a big account on Twitter. Like, you're, you're talking maybe 30,000 followers. You're in the YouTube space. Do you feel that there's a certain kind of sense of pressure and you use a bag of coin to deliver with rank? And what kind of advice would you give, say, FPL managers to help cope with a bad game week? So kind of two questions in one there. Um, so to start with, do I feel pressure? I haven't until this season. Of course, I don't want to do, you know, dreadfully, but I haven't felt. But this season, I've started to notice quite a lot of people on in my DMs now on Twitter, but also a lot of my YouTube comments are, is this your final team? I'm copying you this season. And that starts to ramp up the pressure a little bit. Now, you know, they shouldn't, it's not great. It's, I don't particularly <laughs> love it, but I know that someone else's team and someone else's week is then riding on my shoulders. So last week when it went really well, it was like, great. All these people were loving it in the comments. And then this week when I put my team selection up and they see how badly I've done, they'll be like, why am I following this idiot? So there is a little bit of pressure. I try not to let it get to me too much. And I, I don't, I think the first couple of weeks was a bit of a shock, but as time, you know, the next few have gone on, like uh, my season will be as it is. And I hope I do as well as I can, but yeah, we'll just see how it plays out. Nice. So tell us a little bit about your process as well. Like, do you watch a lot of games live? Do you look at data? And then if you do like, what kind of tables do you look at? And do you use a planner to kind of plan ahead? I know you already said maybe four or five games is how long you keep someone. You try not to take a hit yeah. unless it's at least maximum of once every four weeks. So I like that because I think the more you change the tickets to the lottery mm -hmm. and you keep buying tickets to different trains, you pick a train because there was a reason for it and then you jump off in rage and then you go to another train and you kind of miss the points as you ride between the assets. And I've seen that yeah. happen when you're on tilt. It happens badly. Yeah, it does. So I, 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 I enjoyed it. There. But anyway, so what is your... Um, process then tell us like in terms of watching games stats and how far ahead do you look do you have like a planner like Ben Krillin maybe yeah so I try and watch as much football as I can not so much because I think it necessarily makes my decisions better I just enjoy watching football so much and especially last year when we were all at home I watched a lot of football especially when all the games were spread out I watched a lot and I imagine that had a little bit of an impact on on how well I did I don't necessarily think it's the only thing but I do think there's a lot of merit in the eye test. But I, I do look at a lot of stats. I use Fantasy Football Fix. I use Fantasy Football Hub um, amongst others as well, like Sofa Score for heat maps and things like that. I use it and I check, you know, I try to narrow it down to a few sort of key players that I'm potentially going to bring in. And then I start and ponder over the week about which one it potentially is, whether that's highlights, whether that's, you know, stats and things like that to try and narrow down which, which one it is, you know. It's not necessarily the best tool, but something like Fantasy Football Hub's points predictor is quite useful and it's quite accurate because it takes into account how likely they are to start as well as those stats to try and actually put it in an output. So just because they've got a really high XG, like how how what does that actually mean for your expected points and things like that? It tries to I try it makes it a little bit more materialist, a bit more like you can see the output rather than just a few like XG or shot stats, which I know a lot of people use, but like myself, you may not know exactly how to interpret them the best. I think like the like say XG just need context as well because like you could see somebody with high XG, but maybe they must have penalty in a game or you know, I think you have to kind of add the two things together. But in terms of kind of content sources, like who would be your like most trusted content sources and how would you kind of decipher between a legitimately good pack and kind of doom bandwagons? Because like we'll see during the week on Twitter. 
bandwagons can gain a wee bit of traction and stuff like that. Like yeah. how do how do how do you kind of take yourself back from a noise and make make the best decision you can? I suppose it it's kind of got to the point now where I actually don't look very much elsewhere for anyone to influence my decisions. I'm I feel like I'm now at the point where I make a lot of them myself. I listen to a lot of podcasts and I watch a lot of YouTube throughout the week but I do it much more because I like listening to it I enjoy it from an entertainment point of view much more than I I need to listen to this to help me make my decision now some of the information I'm sure goes in but it's not it's not why I, I turn it on in the first place so there are bits of content and but come the end of the week there are it's pretty much my decision and, and actually a lot of this came down to the end of last season when I was about 10 15k with about 10 weeks left it got to the point where i was like if i'm gonna get this top 10k finish i'd rather miss out on the top 10k finish because of what i've done and rather than if i'm missing out on it because i followed the herd and ignored my my own decision if i'm gonna miss out on it let me blame myself but i don't want to be in a position where i've missed out on it because i didn't trust myself and i went with someone else so and then it paid out quite well for me. So I'm, the more as time goes on, I'm starting to make my own decisions more and more, I think. Good. So I'll answer it like that. So what, what do you think then in terms of like fixture blocks, just on that note? So do you have different fixture blocks you bring in, say, cheap defenders, like 4.5 defenders versus premiums? And where are you using your transfers mainly, like after you wildcard, what price point and what position? Yeah, so I feel like this season's been a little bit different. I've heard there's a lot of talk about that rotation of the premiums that we're going to have to do this season. So in terms of fixtures, I tend to look sort of four, five, maybe six game weeks, three at a push. You know, Villa at the start of the season, I thought three game weeks was enough for them. But yeah. one game we see a lot of times throughout the season. We saw, we've seen it a lot over the past couple of years with Kane, where they've had one good fixture and people have brought in a player in order to captain him that week. I would say 90% of the time that goes wrong and it doesn't pay out for you. I I just don't, it's not, it's not the way I play. It's, it, that's a high risk, high reward strategy and it doesn't fit with how I play the game. So I tend to look for, yeah, four plus game weeks, three if it's short term. And then when I wildcard, I, I, I'm fine to book in transfers, maybe two or three game weeks down the line. But as I am for game week one, as I will be for when I, after I play my wildcard, I don't want to play a transfer that week. And ideally, I want to be in a position where in theory I could burn a transfer the week after. Mm. Now, it, it will come to the point where you know you'll have to use a transfer somewhere so you won't burn that transfer. But if you set up in that position, then the chances are your team is much better for a, for a longer period of time than it would be if you just sort of, you know, went in for a player with a one-week punt on your wild card. It then doesn't play out as you want long-term and you end up, needing another wild card because you've took too many punts on it i don't think i've ever burned a transfer i don't think i have either <laughs> we know people who have who've come on the we show do. yeah it's crazy achievement not unlocked but yeah. um look see in terms of like price changes it's all like it's almost i suppose a game within a game like so to a certain extent do you focus on price changes would you go early in the week in terms of your transfers i think i know what you're going to say to this or do you just kind of sit back, watch it pan out, make your transfer on a Friday and try and make the best possible decision? Um, I think you know what I'm going to say based on what I've done this week already. However, I try to wait as long as possible if I can. It's just dependent on, on how much value I think I'm going to lose. If I'm going to do a transfer from one player to another and they're going to rise on Saturday night and the other player is just going to hold it, if that's point one. I think that's worth and I'll wait throughout the rest of the week and I'll wait until late until late in the week to transfer. However, you know, if it's point two and then there's likely to be another one, point three, if you're making a double transfer come the end of the week, then I will go early. I don't necessarily think it I've never I think I've been quite fortunate. It's never completely backfired on me making early transfers that much on like a regular basis. So it's gone wrong sometimes, but I do take the risk occasionally. I'm I'm not I have to wait till Thursday, Friday. I will make them early if I think I'm going to gain a bit of team value. Um, but I do try and wait as long as possible if I can. What about Champions League week? 
Well, <laughs> Champions League group, yeah, especially if your players are going to play, it's probably best that you would have to wait until later in the week. Tough no, but I do, I, do, I do take your point because like when you, when we're looking at the market, especially this week, I'm considering, say, like a game we, I'm going off on a tangent here. I'm considering like a game week eight wild card, yep. but I'm looking at the players that I would buy in a game week eight wild card, and I'm thinking, could I just be buying those boys this week? And I, I would yep. probably be, up, I would probably be up a million pound in terms of value because Cancelo is going to raise Rudiger's probably rules already, Lukaku's rules, yep. and all these players are maybe going to kind of get away from you in terms of price. And I thought of a bit of price anxiety on Saturday night where I was looking at the market, and then I just. I literally just closed the FPL stats and thought, no, nah, you know what? I'm not getting bogged down on this whole kind of transfer price market shit, and I'm just going to... Yeah, no, no, exactly. I'm glad you did, because I started... I did it last week when I brought in Rudiger, and then I was scared about when Livramento played and Rudiger blanked, and I was like, oh, fuck, he's got high EO, and that's what... I lost my rank, like, because of that. But I'm not moving on prices again. I'm going to try and avoid looking for a while. Just uh, on that note then, so Harry, because you talked about the wild card. Yeah. And I feel like there's different plans from everyone here tonight. So would you say that you generally, most seasons would use your wild card to set up other chips? And how do you feel about most of the chips? Like, do you feel they're overvalued? So my first wild card, I don't play in relation to other chips. I think it's quite similar for a lot of people. I play it probably six or seven weeks in um or later if i can hold it but i tend to plan quite early to get on those fixture swings to once i know a bit more of what's going to happen in the league who's going to play well once the structure becomes a bit more clear then i'll play it the second wild card comes much more into play with blank game weeks double game weeks and then in, in theory when you're going to play your chips as well so my second one i save so i can help me navigate those blanks and doubles but also help me make sure i've got the best team for the bench boost and the triple captain I see a lot of talk about the chips are overrated, the chips, you know, it's a burden, play your bench boost in game week one to get it out of the way. And I can I completely disagree with it. Um, last season, I, I you know, I finished 3.8K. My three highest game week ranks were when I played my triple captain, when I played my bench boost, and when I played my free hit. All three of my highest scoring game weeks were when I played my chips, which helped me get the rank that I have. If you can nail your chips and nail them really well, you can have as bad game weeks around it as you possibly can. In my last 10 game weeks, I think I had three green arrows, but they were the three weeks I played my chips. And I ended up over that time having three greens and seven reds, but actually moving from 20K to 3.8K because of how big those green arrows were because I maximized my chips. That's what it's all about. Like, if I look, say, at last year, like, I think I, I kept my bench boost, like, and everybody was kind of laughing at me because they were like, why are you keeping your bench boost? Because I think even Will on, like, the, the hub videos was saying anybody that kept their bench boost, you know, he's basically a fucking idiot. I, I got, like, 170-plus points out of my bench boost week. Exactly. And I, had, and I had a game week rank of, like, 500 before hats, even though I took a bag hat that week. But it got me, like, a massive green arrow towards the end of the season, and I just don't think like the chips are so cut and dry and black and white. You know, I think everybody right. tries to have this kind of, oh, this is the kind of preordained strategy of how you should play your wild cards and chips. And I do think you can deviate. And I do think you can do things a bit differently as well. Yeah, I agree. I was going to see here, but if you wanted to talk a little bit outside of FPL about what Harry obviously does on his channel and give him a little bit of a shout out while we're here. And the viewers are now up to 37. So they're coming in slowly, Harry. We've got Tom Stevenson here as well. So he's a lover of the chips too. We'll, we'll shout out some of the guests soon as well, Harry, because we went straight into the interview because there wasn't as many people here earlier, but they're all here now. So we'll introduce them in. But before that, do you want to ask him about his uh, side? Yeah. Hustle? And I guess they're both. So, so as we've already mentioned, so your Twitter account, you've got, You've gone plus 30k followers, your YouTube channel, you've got 12k subscribers. When did this all start? Like what was what was the motivation, I suppose, be, behind FPL FPL tops? Was this like a conscious decision you made, or did you just kind of join FPL Twitter to get a bit of advice? Or yeah, so I used to follow a couple of them. One actually who's not that active anymore called FPL Guidance was actually the first account that I ever used to ask. And talk to and he will still always remain the number one that started me 
getting into the community. I then created my own because I wanted to talk to a few more people and just thought, oh, if I'm going to do it, I may as well have my own one. When I started in 2017, the community was pretty small. It's grown so much over that. And then it got to the point where I was like, oh, okay, you know, gaining a few followers is quite fun. Um, I started putting out a few little bits on Twitter, like some of my key findings, some of my key players I'm looking to target. And I just chatted to people and it went from there. I, the, I hear a lot of people say, you know, you've got to be different to do to do well on on Twitter or anything like that. I was just really active. Um, I just chatted to a lot of people and it probably filled up people's timelines and a lot of people probably got annoyed with it at times. But I was just really active and I chatted to people. And in terms of the YouTube, it's always something I feel like for anyone who doesn't know, so I'm 23. I've I've sort of grown up with YouTube being like a very big part of my life. And of a lot of what like my friends do and a lot of people my age are now quite big on YouTube. So when I was growing up sort of 15, 16, I always wanted to give it a go. And I never, so I tried like FIFA or things like that, but there was so much at the time, especially with like the Sidemen becoming big. FIFA was what everyone was doing. So I didn't really work. And then I suppose when I was on Twitter and I saw other people doing YouTube, I just thought, oh, maybe this is what I can give it a go in. I started doing a few streams um, for a couple of seasons. And then last year, I started doing a few more of the videos um, and I just keep doing them because it's a skill that I've always wanted to learn more than anything, like the streaming, but also the the, the making of videos, like the editing. Like my what I do is probably not that great in comparison to what someone like Andy does, but it's a skill that I've developed and I'm quite happy with where it is for something that I've taught myself to do, so. Nice. Nima, I think you're on mute. mute. He's on, you're on mute, bro. Oh, okay, yeah. I was, <laughs> I was saying, um, what advice would you give then to people who are kind of maybe new to the game and they're looking to grow their socials or their channels? You, I mean, I don't. I still don't think I'm in any position to comment on YouTube. I'm still guessing and asking, you know, anyone I can questions. They, YouTube, it just loves consistency. Um, it's the big thing. Um, it loves you getting people to watch as much of your tar or of your video as possible. And it loves you uploading on a regular basis. Um, if you take weeks out at a time and then come back, even if you put out four videos in four days, it, it's not going to appreciate it. So if you have a game week out, it starts to, you know, throw you down the rankings and it, some weeks I'm like, Oh, you know, I need to put out these, all these videos and I've had a bad week and it can be difficult, but it is what YouTube likes. Um, so yeah, just consistency is as boring as it sounds. Do you have any aspirations to go full time FPL? Um, not particularly. I mean, if someone offered it to me, of course I would, you know, be very happy to take it. But it's not. It's not why I I do it, and I don't put out. I don't put out a video, you know, three times a week because I think I need to do this because one day I'll, I'll get there. If you know, if I keep going and that's where it gets to me, that would be great. And, you know, I would make me very happy. But I, if I don't get there, I'm not going to consider what I've done a failure. That makes sense. No, I like it. It's not going to cover our livelihoods and no. our quality of life. But if it somehow did one day, obviously, it would be like the greatest dream come true. But yeah, exactly. It can become like work, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, when that's the even other when, side of it. Then yeah, the bad game would sting even more. Because yeah. then it's like you're, you're you're like trying to survive and pay your mortgage with the ranks. Yeah, it's like you have a bad game week, and you you know instead of having a roast dinner, you only get bread and butter. That's what it starts to turn into. So, <laughs> but I think in, in FPL, you know, you've made up when you start advertising ball shavers like manscaping and stuff like that. So I think that's really the aim for us at Net That Hole. Once once we get under the manscaping, that's 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 what made it like. <laughs> Yeah, I'll wait for you two to be advertising that. I'll look forward to the episode where I have <laughs> Nima and Hibbo trying to tell me about Manscaped. That would be, we've reached pinnacle then, I think. Yeah, we were on this website, Podcorn, and they like uh, link you up with advertisers for the podcast version. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of the stuff and I think Mariner would like panic if he saw what they wanted. So I've been looking for some football related brands, but I've seen today Hibbo sent me a link from a friend of ours, a previous uh, guest on the show and it was just their tweet with um an ad and someone said to them is this an advertising account now so it's like people are so brutal when when you do start to even try yeah. to make money from fpl if you're like putting out too many ads they'll come off to your head and there was a yeah. big scandal wasn't there like no one was using hashtag ad for ages and no one's been willing to speak about it for like a year or two 
yeah, there is a big people don't like ads or you know tr- people trying to make money out of out of FPL. Um, if people work hard enough, then someone's going to want to pay for it. Then go for it. Who are we to judge? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Outside of FPL, um, I guess you're a big Chelsea fan. You attend games, so I'd love to hear a little bit about this. And I know there was a really tough part as well before where you were meant to go to the final, was it, of the Champions League? And obviously, I think your brother couldn't make it with you. Is that right? Do I remember this story correctly? Yeah, you do. So, yeah, I'm a big Chelsea fan. I have season tickets, so I go most home games. So I was there at the weekend, unfortunately, but I've also seen a lot of good results over the past couple of years. Um, So, yeah, I was meant to go, well... I had me and my brother had two tickets to go to Porto to watch Champions League final. Um, and before you go, you have to take proper PCR tests in order to get a certificate in order to be able to fly. We don't live together. So, you know, if one of us had it, it was fine. In theory, the other could go. But my brother tested positive on the Friday with the Saturday being on the the Saturday being the final. So suddenly, I, you know, I had a decision to make. Do I fly to Porto on my own for the first time? I've been away in about a year and a half um, to watch a game that I really thought we were going to lose. Um, or, you know, do I stay, you know, without him not going? It, 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 the final thing that, that did it for me was, let's say we do win it. What What is more, what's going to, what am I going to hate myself more for? If I go and we don't win or if we I don't go and we do win. And I, as soon as that, thought crossed my mind I was like well I'm getting on that plane and it turns out yeah we won and much to my girlfriend's hatred it goes down as the best night of my life and she doesn't appreciate that comment so much but it still gets used quite a lot no she can she can ask you to put the wedding day ahead of that but until the girlfriend becomes a wife Mm. that's why it's your favorite day exactly so far remember you say it's like the um have you seen the Simpsons thing where um Homer's telling Bart and he's like, Bart's like, that is the worst day of my life. And then he goes, the worst day of your life so far. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's what they used to put that meme out about Arsenal fans whenever we have a bad week. Yeah. So that's why I know the meme from. <laughs> <laughs> you see it a lot. Yeah, I see that meme a lot. But um, so I guess just looking at your current season then, so talk a little bit about your play style um, and your previous amazing ranks. You've had a must say top 5k last yeah. season with the most players ever. So Let's see how you do this year. And I know you had a good start. So I think, obviously, there's a game on right now to timestamp it for the podcast listeners. I don't yes. know how much of it has finished, but it's looking like it's a second 60 half. minutes. No, you don't have a one nil the pass, for fuck's sake. Zaha penalty, I understand. So it's a shame. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine Sanchez has got that penalty save. It would have been epic. But we that means our new. ranks are even worse, aren't they, Harry? Because what we needed hasn't happened tonight. Yeah, oh, a penalty save would have been great. I mean, that Brighton defensive ownership is like ninety five percent. So in theory, I don't, I don't particularly mind if we keep if they keep a clean sheet or not. Wouldn't mind a save point for him. He's on two saves as of now. He needs one more. Okay, That's needs one fun. more. It's not often he gets penalties. It will be. I know. It's always when I'm watching points. my goalkeeper. I'm always like, do I want the opposition to take shots <laughs> so I, my goalkeeper can get saves, or do I want them not to take shots? so that I can not get another minus point for them scoring a second goal. That's the kind of keepers we all have at 4.5. Um, yeah. I'm not a big fan of the premiums. I've seen people asking about Mendy as part of like a Chelsea double up. So it'll be interesting when we get to the Chelsea part yeah. to get your opinion on that as well. But um, just to talk about your current season, then for the podcast listeners who can't see the team, I'm going to read it out from the back. So you've got Sanchez in goal, Trent, Rodriguez, Shaw. Um, you've got Greenwood, Saar, Salah, Ben Rama. You got Dennis, Ronaldo, Antonio, Rafinha on the bench. That's a bit unfortunate with the eight pointer. Oh, oh um, God! Tell us about it. Does he sub on for sure? <laughs> if only and the amount of jokes I made. You oh, were just great. checking, just in case. You were like, it's "No great. way!" Great, Rafinha gets a sub on for sure. I made also the joke that White would sub on for sure as well. About I literally was. I put it up twenty one seconds before Spurs scored, and then everyone's like, "You jinxed it. It's all your fault." And I was like, "Oh well." You can't, no one else can have any points if I can't have them. Um, but yeah, I feel like of all the weeks that I could have come on with you guys to talk about um, Chelsea in my season, Chelsea lose and I've had a dreadful game week. So <laughs> all in all, it's not been great. But as I was saying before I came on, last week I moved from 250k up to 35k. I scored 86 points you know, last week with a 50k 
game week rank, which was crazy. I benched Rafinha. I didn't think Leeds would put up a performance. They had all those injuries. However good Rafinha was, I thought that they just wouldn't be able to get a foothold in the game. Dennis was playing at home against a Newcastle team who have been poor defensively and have a lot of injuries. Looking back on it, it's a mistake. Like you, We talk a lot about judge the input not the outcome and even judging the input i think i made i made a mistake here you know i can sit in here and admit it i've also made a lot of good decisions so far this season but this is one that didn't wasn't a good choice i think seeing dennis starting and rafinha on your bench that does hurt me but it's also the you know it's something i told you before the show so i thought i had a bad game week with 38 points and sanchez to go and obviously you yeah. came on and as you say the worst game week of your season i oh, know <laughs> and dreadful. your team lost dreadful and i brought in rudiger as well i i did the yeah, same move as you last yeah. week <laughs> i brought in rudiger as well so all in all it was just great <laughs> but you're still an or of like i guess it was 90k before the match i don't know where it is now but um probably around 100k at least and it's very good for this stage of the season so i think yeah. that's what we're all forgetting as well like my friend i was complaining to him um tineshi watched the show and i was like oh, i've gone from 1k to 7k rank and <laughs> he said i've gone from 100k to 700k count your blessings and i realized the points are still very tight so like yeah, I so very, lost, very, yeah it's too tight, spoke, right? <laughs> yeah i've spoken about this a lot and i've been like this is i'm at 100 i'm at 90k after six game weeks now which is the best start that practically anyone on twitter has had in past years yet mm -hmm. it's not as good as other people we need to put it into a little bit of perspective that yes you might be behind other people but it's still a cracking start it does feel though like half at least half of the fpl community is in the top 100k at the moment which is crazy it will make it slightly more difficult to you know break into those top ranks if everyone active is doing so well but People will drop off and it is still better at being 90k People now. People will than... always drop off, won't they? There's always going to be dead teams yeah. or something. I wonder I'm if saying... there'll be less of a drop off this year than maybe we've seen before because of, you know, those template high ownership teams that a lot of the, in theory, engaged managers started with have done well. So there are less engaged managers outside of these top ranks. But it's still a great, you know, it's better to be at 90k now than probably the 1 million I was at this point last season. So... I think Nemo makes a good point about the condensed ranks because if we if we put too much kind of credence in our rank at the minute and we base our kind of happiness on where we're sitting, we're we're kind of bad game week away from like a bad kind of swing and variance where we, we we get this kind of massive red arrow as well. Like you know, so I think we should just kind of appreciate that we've had solid starts. You're going to have red arrows and like that's how it's going to be. So like in terms of your transfers, like what's your plan of attack now for the fixture swing for Chelsea? Because I can see you've got Rudiger. You've got two free transfers, and or you had two free transfers in the bank. So, like, tell, had, tell, tell the people what the plan is. So, I had two free transfers. The plan has been executed. So, because I have my wild card left, it does allow me to be a little bit more aggressive in terms of trying to trying to get some of those price changes. So, a lot of the reason you know people play an early wild card is because you lose out on team value. So if I plan, my plan in theory is to save my wild card to game week 14 because I don't think I need it. So I went early, I went early this week and made two free transfers to get on players who are rising and to sell two players who in theory, I think will both fall in price this week. So, and which would affect my selling price of both of them. So if I didn't have my wild card left, I probably wouldn't have done it. But in theory, if it all goes horribly wrong in the Champions League, if I had to wild card this week or next week, I'm quite happy with it. It's what I plan to do at the beginning of the season. But if I then don't have to and I can save my wildcard to later and it does work, then I know I've gained a fair bit of team value in doing it. So Ronaldo has left my team. He has left the building. Um, the you big Ronaldo-Lukaku right? switch has happened. The reason I kind of... I think the, the decision between both of them is very difficult this week and it could go either way. Um, and I'm not thinking that Ronaldo is going to blank, but I hope that Lukaku can do something. But it allowed me to free up the money that I needed in order to do Shaw up to Cancelo, who was also rising in price before I did it. Did it, but yeah, that's a good time to catch the early swings. Later yeah. in the season, you can make up for any early mistakes. And it wasn't even for a hit, right? No, it was two free transfers, yeah. See, that, that's the ideal situation to be in. Um, and that's what I meant by an incredible start. Um, I just, one thing I want to ask you, though, do you think the best time to strategically wildcard this season is for people who want to do it now in game week seven to catch the price rises like you're suggesting? 
or after the international break in game week eight? Or would you even now, as you're saying, wait till maybe 14, 15? And someone I think in the live chat mentioned there's the AFCON as well. And they were surprised that yeah. the kind of the wild card later in the season isn't as popular at the moment on Twitter. Yeah, so I think if you can save it, saving it till late is definitely worth doing because um because of those AFCON, as you said, also the Chelsea, you know, Super Cup likely to have a blank in game week 17 and game week 18 which you know if we're all loading in on Chelsea now could be a bit of a problem but I think if you want a wild card I'd probably do it next week rather than this week now you've missed quite a lot of price changes on those players you'd probably want to buy like I think Saar went up Lukaku's already risen Cancelo's already risen and then the other ones you probably own. I'd probably wait till next week because of the likes of City and Liverpool playing each other this week. Now I would, I'd probably wait next week. I do think it's a good time to wildcard. I think there's a lot of benefits and there's starting to be a real structure. And if your team is far enough away from that sort of structure that I'm sure we'll potentially talk about, then I think it's a very good time to wildcard and I wouldn't put anyone off. I saw the early wildcards and it was, I couldn't get on board with it and I didn't do it and I'm glad I didn't. But it's got to the point now where, to be honest, at any point, I think, you know, it's fine to be playing a wild card now. Well, just to kind of touch on, I suppose, the common week and like, uh, where are you sitting in terms of your early captaincy thoughts? So, like, you've said Ronaldo's leaving the building. Yeah. I'm assuming it's going to be like Kiaki at home to Southampton. Yeah. So my, option too, I suppose? Yeah, my, my three, uh, I don't think I'd captain Rudiger. I just don't think he's explosive enough. He doesn't score enough goals for us. The others are, in theory, Antonio at home to Brentford. Now, Brentford have looked good. They did concede three times in game week six. But I, I think they'll be better away from home defensively than they necessarily will be at home, Brentford. I think when they're at home in front of the fans, they'll want to attack a little bit more, as we saw against Liverpool. But away from home, they might want to be shut up shop a little bit more than they do. The other one, I, I can't believe I benched him this week, is Rafinha. Playing that, playing that Watford team who are can't seem to keep a clean sheet to save their life, you know, with Ben Foster cycling GK in goal. As much as I love him, I don't necessarily think he'll be keeping Rafinha or Leeds out this week. But at the moment, I don't see me putting it on anyone but but Lukaku. Yeah, I think FPL Flannel, who's here tonight, shout out to him. He said that if any uh, yeah. Premier League player liked his post, he would bring them in and captain them, I think. And Ben Foster replied, yeah, there he is. Nathaniel's come up in the chat. Yeah. Let's um, move your team and we'll go to the free heads for the fireside chat. Because this way, when I put the comments up in the live chat, it doesn't cover someone's head in the yeah. other view with the slide. <laughs> so yeah, I know. Captaining Foster is a... Yeah, that. good luck to him. But he replied, right? It's like my Traore yeah. effort replied to... Was it Traore? No, St. Maximin. No, Someone replied St. Maximin to replied to FBL Adama, yeah. Oh, to FBL Adama, that's it. <laughs> he brought him into his game with one team. He insulted him in an FPL way. And then he was like, no, trust me, I'm going to get points. That's Patrick like Van this- Arnhold did that to me once. It was a long time ago, so people don't remember it as much. Um, he said, I said, should I own you? He put up like, anyone got any questions? I'm like, yeah, should we own you in our game week one team? And he replied being like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't own him and he did nothing. So just because players say it doesn't mean it's actually going to happen. Uh. <laughs> I don't agree with this whole kind of a thousand likes and I'm going to cap and fucking loud no. and all this nonsense. Like, you, know, you, do see, you do see this on Twitter, like, you know, a uh, hundred yeah, likes no, and I get a tattoo in yeah. and stuff, you know, that's, no. I was talking about our friend Heisen. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Heisen, I thought Heisen was going to get the tattoo in his arse, but I got it on his leg. I think he should, he should have got it in his arse. Uh, that's so dear. good. So it couldn't be seen. Yeah. But, <laughs> So you're going to go with Lukaku then. So I have Ronaldo, Harry, and yeah. he is my boss team captain, but yeah. I am like you thinking about just moving to Lukaku, but I wasn't worried about the price because I feel like I'm dropping money anyway. So I've got mm. a lot in the bank. I'm still going to save money either way. And I'm looking to see what happens in the Champions League because I'm going to tell you a horror story. Uh, I do not wish this happens to you this week, but you still have a wild card to save you. Yeah, I still have a wild card. So yeah, that's the thing. So I had, a, I think it was Ibrahimovic. I brought him in for a Man United double game week. And he did his knee injury in the Champions League. 
and then I'd take a minus four to sell him for the double game week. This is, this is what, this yeah, night, this is a nightmare. This is what you, <laughs> you, you wake up in sweats thinking that these things are going to happen. But at least you have a wild card. Um, yeah, so, exactly. So what do you think in that regard? Would you, what would you say to someone like me who is looking to save his wild card to like game week 14, 15? And I have Ronaldo now, but I'm not sure if I really trust United as like the way I look at them when I see them attacking. Like Ronaldo mm. could score, as you say, but something feels off compared to say the attack and the fluidity of the other three big teams. I, I agree. I think they don't look that great. And if you look at the three goals he's scored so far in the league, two of them have been goalkeeper fumbles, haven't they? Great point. If, yeah. if they have a decent keeper in net, which, you know, I don't, although I don't rate Pickford that highly at times this weekend, I don't see him doing things like that. So yeah. I I, th- I think he's a good captaincy option. And I think, you know, if you've got him this week and you don't necessarily need to sell him to Lukaku like I did because I needed the money partly, they're both good captaincy options. I wouldn't worry at all about having yeah. him in your team. I, it's, it's not something that I would let put you off at all. I think he's a good captaincy option this week. Everton kept a clean sheet against Norwich, but it's Norwich. So Yeah, now freemium feels a bit difficult because he's had a rough few weeks. But this yeah. is the week it would normally pay off. So it's like yeah. what you were saying. Your best season was three big game week ranks that you had each yeah. of them with chips. But equally then, if you can have whatever, let's say, your next top three game week ranks yeah. are without chip usage, that's another way to keep improving your game each year, I reckon. Not yeah. just focus on the best weeks with chips, but look at the best yeah. weeks without. And I think there's like that in fan team, isn't there, Hibo, where first place gets um, across the whole 38 weeks, whoever gets the best game week rank in a single game week gets a cash prize, right? And it, I don't mm. think hits count. No, I don't think so. You're not supposed to tell anybody about this. No, yeah, I know. But let's see if we can get them to use the refer a friend link and we all get one free ticket each. But that's hashtag ad. Um, now, what's your one-week differential punt for those wildcarding into game week eight? Um, the thing is, and I've spoken a lot about it, and I mentioned it this week when I said Townsend was my differential for this week, is targeting that left-hand side of Norwich, which has been dreadful. There has been yet to be a single player to blank against, that plays right wing for their team, to blank against the left-back of Norwich. This includes Townsend, includes um, uh, Brighton of Leicester. That's the one. So, But I don't think I particularly back back Burnley very much to go and score. I'm just trying to remind myself... Vardy's been on fire. I couldn't. It would be hard for me to look past Vardy again. Jimenez against Newcastle. I still think he's back in. He's such a bonus point magnet, as we saw again. If you've got a spare spot, because you've got Bamford, for example, if he's injured, a one-week punt to Jimenez is probably where I'd go, or Jamie Vardy if you have the money in the bank. Here's my here's my opinion on this. Right now, see these kind of punts for like game week seven because you're going to well card in game week eight. Mm-hmm. You're nearly putting yourself in a position, in my opinion. Now. I'm like kind of 90, well, maybe not 90%, I'm maybe 70% sure, 80% sure I'm going to wild card. But I don't want to like play these kind of punty punts where I'm going to dead end on the fucking wild card. Like I would rather make kind of like a sensible transfer decision where I say brought on Lukaku and maybe brought on like maybe Rudiger or Alonso or somebody like that. So that whenever I look at my team the next week, I might look at my team and think, maybe I don't need the wild card. Do you know what? I don't, I don't want to kind of, pick some absolute shite bag who's got one good fixture just because I'm kind of thinking about dead ending and then you look at your team and think have I kind of like thrown away my flexibility here by just deciding to punt on like this one guy like you know I don't know like it's I'm a wee bit torn on the whole kind of well I'm going to well card in yeah. game week 8 and I'm kind of in that respect I'm kind of torn in because initially I had thought I could have dropped Salah I could have went Ronaldo and Lukaku as a two premium forward structure yeah. And now I'm not so sure because I'm looking at Salah and Salah looks as if he's playing the best football he's ever played. And I'm thinking, I'm basically dead end on Andy. Like a wild card if I do something like that. So I don't know if I necessarily want to do that, you know. But that's that's me yeah. going on a tangent. No, but he has that was me last up. week, actually. It was me last week. I was selling Simicast and I knew I was doing that. And I, I was like, I originally had it planned to go for that you know, game week eight wild card, and I almost went with either Pereira of Leicester or Semedo of Wolves. Now, Semedo outscored Rudiger this week, but if I'd have gone for either of them, it would have pretty much guaranteed I needed to wild card in game week seven or game week eight because I then wouldn't have had any Chelsea this week, two free transfers, then no City the week after. 
but I decided to go Rudiger, although I, you know, I'm probably five points down on it. I'm actually now in a position where I can save my wild card for another six weeks because of that transfer I made, I think. No, that's a that's good really point. interesting. No, that's really interesting. So we'll, we'll kind of move on to, I suppose, we, we've talked about your history, we've talked about your kind of current team, but I think we're going to move on to kind of burning issues and hot topics because that's what people are here for, to kind of get your thoughts and kind of have an organic chat around these. So we're going to start on, I suppose, the question in everybody's mind, and it's Ronaldo or Lukaku. Yeah, so I can see your stats up on screen here. Just to, so I suppose to add a little bit of context, over the past three weeks, Lukaku has, has not been... He's not been great, but he's also been very isolated in the games that we've played. He could have had returns in, you know, against... Um, he could have had returns against Spurs. He was very isolated against City. He didn't look in the game at all. And when he was, you know, it wasn't there. Ronaldo has had, you know, pretty good fixtures. And I suppose his XG is high. If we think about some of the chances and rebounds he's had, like he is, he's taking a lot of shots and that is really good for anyone who's got him. But... We see a lot of small sample size questions on Twitter. I would suppose I'd probably look at these with a little bit of caution in terms of I think Lukaku's will start to improve heavily over the next couple of weeks and Ronaldo's may not look quite as favourable. I'm getting to the point where I think they're pretty even assets for me between them over the next run of fixtures. It could go either way, but the million pound that I'm saving in them allows me to own a Chelsea defender instead of or owning a Man City defender over owning a 5 million or a 4.5 million defender, which I think the combination of what I can do with Lukaku now is better. I think that's a yeah, fair that's point. I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to talk people through just for the, for the podcast listeners, so the on-screen graphic. So this data has been pulled down from Fantasy Football Hub, so shout out to them. So this is basically like a three-game week, head-to-head battle. So... We're talking about Ronaldo leads in the goal front, so he leads three goals to two. He's dominant in the shot front, so like say 17 shots to five. And in XG terms, he's got 2.85 XG to the 0.89. But again, context is very important here because over the last three, Ronaldo's played Newcastle at home, West Ham away, and Aston Villa at home. And even the XG is a bit of a... Like you're talking about small sample size, must lead in the XG. We look at those kind of tap-ons against Freddie Woodman, they would have been they, yeah. they would have been huge XG like you know and I think whenever you look on the flip side for Lukaku he played Villa he played Spurs he played Man City definitely yeah. more difficult opposition though but whenever whenever I watched Lukaku against Spurs he seemed to be up and not to shoot and at times when he passed the ball he played Kovacic in for a great chance and Werner in for a great chance both of them could have scored and like he was kind of laying the ball on against Spurs I thought you could have scored with every time he attacked. Do you know, to be completely honest with you, like, and I, I don't know if that was a credit to how good Chelsea were in the day, or we've been talking in the WhatsApp chat about how bad Spurs have been, because we see they've shipped 3D Palace, 3D yourselves, and 3D Arsenal, which is, yeah, doesn't look doesn't look good. They've been dragged around London by the mm. collar. <laughs> I feel bad for our friends. I had to wear the we don't feel very bad for them, do we? No, I talk about the one League Cup in 23 years when they come at me and talk about not being a big club. But I do love my Spurs friends. I don't want to get dislikes on the show. So we'll move on swiftly from them. <laughs> we did well last week. It was only one dislike compared to whatever. So I must insult so many people in the live chat and some of them just take it real personal, I think. But um, it's okay. We we live on. I think the podcast viewers love the fun of when it's live. So if anyone's watching on VOD, do come in later and have a look. Um, So... Let's just talk about fixtures for Man United then, because I guess from my perspective, like I had originally planned to sell uh, Ronaldo this week. And then after a while, I thought this fixture with Everton was as good as the Southampton fixture for Lukaku. But yeah. now I'm starting to doubt that again. And now I'm thinking maybe I should have done what you did and moved early and just got Lukaku and saved the money for upgrading. Because over that next eight weeks, I'm not going to captain Ronaldo enough to worry about like what will happen. And I expect them both to score similarly. And, Lukaku has better fixtures so is one of your decisions motivated by fixtures and are you more of a kind of formal fixtures kind of player um I'm a little bit of both I kind of at the point where I think fixtures bring form um to some extent so I think having good fixtures will help a player be on good form and I think we've seen it 
I stand by Salah when he has a good fixture being the best captaincy option in the game. And if Salah has a good fixture, home or away, if I think Salah is going to start, I will captain Salah over either of these two because he gets the extra point for clean sheet. He gets the extra point for the goal. And he's just so involved in absolutely everything that Liverpool do. Over the next week, over the next five weeks, Ronaldo, when you don't want to captain Salah, is probably not as good as Lukaku. Again, I think there's very little to choose between them. I really do. I think it could go either way, but it is just those better fixtures and then what more I can do with that money when I don't have him. I just, I don't think Ronaldo is a bad pick at all. I, I, I wouldn't begrudge anyone who decides to keep him at all. He can definitely know what Ronaldo's like. He can score goals against anyone and as many as he'd like, really. But it's just that little bit of extra money I needed. What do you think about just the penalties before we move on? So do you think that Bruno is now on them because of what happened? Or do you think that this means Ronaldo will take the next one? And if he doesn't have them and there's tighter fixtures, does that Mm. even lessen the appeal more kind of between now and December potentially? I don't think we Bruno Fernandes will take another penalty that means anything ever again. <laughs> Did you see his apology tweet? Um, they said it's, Martinez. Uh, his apology tweet is oh. almost as embarrassing as the penalty he took. It's a few books um, long. It's, yeah. it's more. It's more embarrassing. It's, it's more embarrassing, more. embarrassing to be fair. Oh, if, if you missed a penalty, and I don't think I don't think it's needed when you miss a penalty. But I don't think Ronaldo. If there's a game that you know it's on a knife edge like that. Ronaldo's not going to stand there and be like, yeah, you know what? You go and take it this time. He'll take it. If they're 3-0 up, great. Bruno might take it. Brilliant. Yeah, but if they're ever point. in a situation like that again, Ronaldo is taking that penalty. I'd be surprised if he doesn't. Just just to touch on, like, so really, like, wh- where's your stance here? Like, you're Well, obviously, you've picked Lukaku, but from, I suppose, a team structure point of view, we're talking about, say, Ronaldo, Lukaku, or both. If you're having both, you're basically three men. So where do you stand on three men? Do you think do you think three men means you must out in a good value or in six million in terms of defence and midfield? Yeah. Because I know those 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 three men teams they may they were guys that played there in the wheelchair, but it looks as if they've squeezed up their defence to kind of four and a half million options and you're maybe missing a Cancelo or how do you feel? I, I put out a tweet earlier which was just big at the Clark back it. is so much better than premium. I I cannot understand when you're going to captain one of these premiums once every three weeks at a maximum, not even that, the defense that you are sacrificing, you know, if you're going, for example, on my wildcard draft that we'll look at in a minute, if I go for an 8 million um, forward option and I go up to Ronaldo, for example, that's four and a half million that I'm spending on a player that I'm not going to captain but I could then in defence upgrade four and a half million. You could upgrade basically all four and a half million options all up to Chelsea or Man City defenders. That's so you could play three, 4.5 million defenders or you could have Trent, Cancelo, Rudiger as your back three. For me, the combination of what you can do with that money just means that that third premium, because you're never going to captain them, is is not worth it. I like that. And then your bench players can be the two defenders. Yeah. And, and some people are doing it with four, right? Because they're doing double City defence and Chelsea defender and Trent with a Livramento. That looks like that's yeah, going to be a template back yeah. there soon. I'm considering going, I'm planning on going four at the back in a couple of weeks. I like that. But is that a four, three, three? Or... Cool, yeah. It will be, because I've stuck with Dennis, for the time being, it will be four, four, two. Okay. I like the um, thought of nearly like a hybrid formation where like I, I know Thomas Kucharski did our graphics for the channel. I spoke about it in the hub chat earlier today, but he basically called his formation four four three because he had the option of kind of playing like a three four three, playing a four four two, but also playing a four three three because I think whenever you've got these value options in terms of your Rudigers and your Cancelos and your six million midfielders, when you go yeah. to two premiums. I think that flexibility is maybe down the line going to save you transfers because you're going to have a decent bench option to say, well, look, you know, I can write it out this week or this guy's got a better fixture. I like how it looks. I think so. Um, yeah. Did you want to just finish off on uh, Chelsea and kind of, I guess, I know you mentioned it, Harry, that Lukaku's stats perhaps in the sample size of the three weeks on screen, they're not yeah. quite accurate or like 
the fixtures are about to turn for both players as well, I think. So just before we move off of these guys, there was some stuff obviously about Alonso and Cancelo you guys were saying. So I know I'm talking about Cancelo. I have Radiger. Alonso yeah. is someone who we want to hear from you about as well because you've obviously now just talked about how you prefer bigger the back to freemium as well. So yeah. so what is your choice before we read out the stats for Alonso and Cancelo? Like, would you get Alonso if you had Rodiger like me? Or would you now be going for that City defender like you did? And why aren't you going double Chelsea defence as a Chelsea fan? So before this week, I was very set on going double Chelsea defence. And then when they kept a clean sheet against us, I started to look at um, their stats a little bit more. They've conceded one big chance and one goal since game week one. Five clean sheets in five matches. Nice it's good for Chelsea you. as well, but it is incredible for Man City. Now, I have spent enough of my life ripping my hair out watching Marcus Alonso walk up and down that touchline. When I'm there every week and I have to sit right with him in front of me, being lazy and putting in nothing and defending dreadfully, there is still part of me which thinks this man is not going to be our left back for the whole season and Chilwell will come back in at some point. Now, it doesn't seem to be happening and it seems to be Alonso's place to lose at the moment. But I but do just... Come. But I just feel like it will come at some point. And if we've got, for example, if Alonso is first choice, Alonso can play Juventus on midweek and then Southampton at home, does he put Chilwell in there? It's just with Champions League and this easy run coming at the same time, mm -hmm. Chilwell will start to get some minutes. And I wonder whether Alonso in the Champions League and Chilwell in the Premier League because of that fixture difficulty, may be what we see. I may be proved wrong. And if I go for a double Chelsea defence next week, which I could still do, it may still be Alonso. Would it not be as uh, equator now that they're so close in price? Like if, if you've missed the price rise like me and Alonso is already, what, 5.8, 5.9? Could I not yeah. go for the certainty of Aspilicueta now if I wanted to be less risk of us and not get the City defender? You could do. I suppose you're, you're owning Alonso because of his attacking threat aren't you? Um, which you're just not going to get from Azpilicueta. Whether he's playing at wing-back with Reese James out, whether he's playing at centre-back, the guy is not going to get many attacking. He's good for bonus points, but he's not the same youngster he used to be. I love him so much and he's my favourite player. I'll be so upset when he leaves Chelsea, but he doesn't have the same attacking threat that he used to. He is His effort going forward is there, but his execution is not quite what it used to be. So he's fine to tick along. Um, where I would go if I didn't want to have Alonso. This is this is part of the reason why I'm favouring double Man City defence over double Chelsea is because outside of Rudiger, I don't know where I want to go in that Chelsea defence. But Cancelo and Diaz looks obvious. It looks clear that that's where I go if I go double Man City. And I feel like is the attacking threat that I potentially get out of Alonso is that going to be outweighed by him being rotated? And actually, am I just better off with Diaz? I just want to talk so about Cancelo and Alonso. I'd go Cancelo. Just while we're kind of on the topic, I suppose, of Chelsea defenders and maybe double kind of Chelsea defence and stuff like that. Yeah. I did a bit of an exercise earlier where like, I took the data down again from Fantasy Football Hub. Now, this was from Tuchel took over for, I think it was Wolves was his first match. And yeah. I basically looked. I basically looked at kind of minutes, starts, subs on and subs off data from appointment from last season. They include this season, just to kind of give an idea, kind of who was playing the yeah. most minutes and stuff like that. Now, Aspilicueta was top top of the charts for like one thousand nine hundred and sixty four minutes. He had twenty two starts, which was the most. But he's also been subbed off four times, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, Rudiger second on like one thousand eight hundred ninety yeah. minutes, twenty one starts. Never been subbed on, never been subbed off. So I think if people are in the market for a kind of a TLC defender who's nailed, and he kind of seems a wee bit more nailed this season. Yeah. He got the goal as well from the set piece, obviously, against Spurs late in the game. Rudiger's yeah. kind of like, in terms of the transfer, like I want, I want to bring in Rudiger. Like I don't want to bring in, say, Alonso or somebody like that. Apart from that, then you're taking a fair drop off because I think Mandy had like 1,845 minutes, 21 starts, subbed off once. Um, and then you're down to kind of Jorginho, Mount, Kovacic, Christensen, Werner, 
James. Alonso has 1,270 minutes, so I think that kind of highlights his risk because I think people could kind of get, you know, they could get carried away by the fact that he started all the games they did so far and think he's invincible, he's never going to drop out. Like, I think it's inevitable, similar to yourself, that, yeah. look, I love Alonso when he plays. His pair 80 stats are completely off the wall. When we prepped our, our pre-season um, our pre-season pod, our pre-season episode on defenders, I actually ex- excluded Alonso from the sample because even though his pair 90 stats were like top of the board, I had this doubt, and I think everybody had this doubt to say, well, there's no point in me including Alonso because I don't think he's going to play these minutes. And as it turned out, he's, <laughs> he's played every frigging minute so far. But no, I think it's important to highlight the minutes. And for anybody that wants that bit of security, go out and get yourself Rudiger. But apart from that, I'm yeah, really good for me, yeah. I'm kind of with you in the double Chelsea defence now after looking at the minutes they say, well, James, I'm, I like James, he's obviously injured. Alonso, I do think he's going to rotate at some point. I think so. I agree. The so. other thing that I think plays a plays a part on this is how good Trevor Chalaber has been, um, who was our sort of youngster playing at centre-back, plays on the right-hand side of the three, in theory, in Azpilicueta's position. Now, previously... Although Christensen can play there, Christensen has tended to rotate centrally with Thiago Silva. Rudiger is the only one he seems to trust on that left-hand side. The only one he trusts, especially when he plays Alonso. He doesn't want to play anyone else when Alonso's on the pitch. But now Trevor Chalobah is good enough to play for us when we need him to, especially in a run of fixtures like this. It worries me a little bit about Azpilicueta because we can play hudson Adoy out wide or when Reese James is back, he can play out wide. There are a lot of centre-backs now, Thiago Silva, Christensen, Azpilicueta and Chalaba, who are all very good and all capable of doing the job that they're needed to do, which would worry me about, about any of those centre-backs. What about Christensen then? Because he's obviously significantly cheaper than both Alonso and Azpilicueta. Yeah, what do you say to people who want to look for him as their second Chelsea defender? And would you condone that then? Or would you still rather... Go yeah, so he's the, he's the only one of our centre-backs that plays in more than one position along that back three. Um, he's the cheapest of the lot as well. If you own him, you kind of need to be under the impression you will get 50, maybe one and two, maybe two and three starts out of him. And I think you're probably not going to get more than that, especially with the Champions League on it. And if your bench is good enough, you know, you've got Ben White, you've got Livermento to accept that, then go for it. But I don't think I am. That is interesting. But would he be your preferred centre-back if you were doubling up or would it be Alonso instead? What would you think? If... If I doubled up with Rudiger, where would I go? I would probably go. Well, if Reese James is out, I'd probably go as Pilaqueta. At least for the short and, term, but you'd have to accept he could be. Yes. Like he, yeah. he seems invincible, but maybe not, as you say, with how yeah. uh, your new player is doing, well, your youth player. But Chelsea's yeah, but... players are cleaning up, right? Livramento is a Chelsea kid too. Yeah. And We've Conor produced Gallagher. a lot of good right backs. <laughs> Reese <Ben> James. <laughs> Livermento, Lamptey, a lot is of Con- good right backs. Yeah, good point, actually, Lamptey. Is Conor Gallagher one of your boys? Yes, he is as well. They're, they're everywhere. You're we have half them. of Europe on our on our loan books. <laughs> <laughs> so look, just just to talk the like the podcast viewers through the, the the on screen graphic here at the moment. So this this is a head to head comparison between Marcus Alonso and Cancelo. So in terms of goals, Alonso leads go- one goal in all. Cancelo ones on the assist front, two to one. Both players had a fairly similar amount of shots, but Alonso takes it slightly, 11 shots to 10. He's been more accurate, so like four four Alonso shots have had the target and only one of Cancelo's has. Alonso dominates XG, 1.06 to 0.57, and Cancelo marginally pops him for expected assists, so 0.75 to 0.71. So again, shout out to Fantasy Football Hub. It's their app, the data, so credit to them for that. Now, I think when you're looking at Cancelo, he had 44 points. Alonso, he's got 39 points for the season. So the only players that are beating these two are Salah, Ben Rama, Antonio and Vardy. So 
I think this is why we're starting to see this kind of sea change in mentality where people are thinking three meme is not really the way to go here because these guys are providing value in defence. Yeah, I agree. No, that's really okay. interesting. Um, just talk of percentage as well then, something I want to know. So with the Chelsea defenders, I am worried that like if you have two of them, is it going to be the case where they're going to be above 100% EO as a defence at some point, do you think, where if you have one of them, it doesn't actually give you a rank boost because you don't have two? Or do you think the City defence will kind of differentiate the template enough that maybe we'll see managers go double of one team and not both? Yeah, I think it will get to the point very soon where there is um, 100% EO on Chelsea. But then I'm banking on there being under 100% under 200% EO on a Man City defender. So yep, that's I'm that's kind of backing City over Chelsea a little bit. But the numbers are so low at the moment because this was before we came live on air, this was something I looked at. So Man City's cumulative defence ownership within the top 10k is 18 percent at the month which is staggeringly low and we're looking at their figures from game week eight and they kind of they're, they're starting to pick up and a little their fixture proof anyway but chelsea are like a cumulative defensive ownership of 37 percent the top 10k so i think this is the thing is if you can't flick the switch and you double on one of these defenses and you double on the right defense at the right time you're going to start to see that this is kind of template breaking stuff where if you get on early, and this is this is this is what's kind of leading me on the wild card because I could do my transfers and say, oh, if I take minus four this week and take minus four the next week, I could just press a wild card button and just get to the team that I want to get at, and I could make those gains. I think quickly as opposed to kind of having yeah. to try and build my team towards. It. Sorry, just slightly distracted. There's been I was a goal. Say there's been news. Let's uh, go off the slides for a second and put this up. Mopai goal with a Veltman assist from friend oh, of the show. A- a- oh, oh. Asa. Uh, Veltman assist. So, uh, <laughs> oh, have oh. you got him? St- you've got I, him started. I, I need a Veltman. They want me head to head. Oh, wow. These head to heads are legendary, Harry. They're, um, and they're what big, that does big. is it pushes Sanchez up to one bonus point. No, I will take that. Has he got a save? Zaha, yeah. the Palace goal scorer, getting no bonus points. Did so he get Mopai the three, Veltman on two? Go on. <laughs> At the moment, Sanchez on one. It's over. It's over now. They're saying Mopai was going to grab some points, maybe as well. Let's see. Who oh. was the assist? Does Sanchez ever make a third save? He's had two saves at I half time. You. Didn't make now a single thought... save in the second half. Oh, that is I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't wait to see him. He's fucking useless. Yeah, when that wild card, he'll be gone. But that wild card's looking further and further away. <laughs> Let's uh, go into the wild card then. It feels like a good time to talk about this. Um, so this is your temp- uh, like your pick kind of for the wild card template for game week seven, uh, Harry. And... I know obviously you might not be playing yeah. it yourself, but it'd be good for you to just read it out for the podcast listeners. And then we'd love to kind of just hear what you would give them as advice in terms of some of the stuff they should be thinking about. So whether they should be booking in transfers or whether like you, they should be waiting at least two weeks. Because I, I try to save a transfer after a wild card, but I haven't seen people want a wild card with a punt in their team and sell them a week later. And so I'd love to hear both read out your wild card team, sorry, and tell us about your advice going forwards from there. Yeah, sure. So um, I've got Ramsdale and Foster in goal with a four at the back of Livermento, but then Trent, Rudiger. I put in Alonso, but having spoken to you guys, it may be Azpilicueta and Cancelo. Douglas Louise in midfield with Saar, Benrahma, Rafinha and Salah with Lukaku, Antonio. And at the moment it's Ings, but again, that could be Jimenez as well, given his performance at the weekend. That is interesting. I think, I think the, Ings, the Ings selection was kind of interesting. That kind of threw me a bit when I saw it. I'm, I, I'm kind of, from what I've seen so far, I kind of like the look of Tony still. And it, like, I bought Tony in my initial team. And then now, like, I'm getting to the stage where I am now. And like, people on Twitter are talking about, oh, I'm thinking about buying Tony. And I'm thinking, I don't know if I want to sell. I don't know if I want when to I, sell. When Tony. I saw that, I was like, wow, 
everyone's been fire selling him, but now they're talking about buying him again for the fixture swing. But just watching him against yeah. Liverpool, it's like, you know, he's got a wee bit of everything about his game. And I know some people are talking about, ah, I don't know if he's great for AFPL, but as far as I can see, he's getting in good positions. He, he's setting up goals and he saves you that wee bit of money. And like part of what I'm thinking about Tony is say, say if you're buying him at 6.3 million, like you're comparing him what you can get in terms of like a Ben Rama or Rafinha, even a Sar. I think he's got a good. I think there's a lot of value in the game. He's got around penalties, about right. six million. He is, he's, he's, got penalties. Penalties. Yeah. he's got penalties. He's got a great record with them. Um, so I had him, and I, I sunk the price drops, and I do so think I. It's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I think I would keep him at this stage, having played him the last two weeks. What's your views on this Ramsdale goalkeeper pack, Nima? I, I think having seen Leno start in the cup game against AFC Wimbledon and. Seeing Ramsdale start his first North London derby and the way he performed, the save at the end. I think, like, obviously, Leno won't just go down, like, without trying. But with no Europe around, it's looking like it's going to be tough for Ramsdale to lose that spot, I think. Um, I think it's the first time we're seeing the new Arsenal kind of team. I've, I think this 11, six of them uh, Arteta purchased himself. And the other five, he extended their contract since he arrived. So it's the first time you're really seeing a team that he's finally playing that actually can do his system like athletically and physically and from a football intelligence point of view. And I'm interested to see what goes on from here because, yeah. you know, we were 20th, uh, Tottenham were first. And now after the weekend, we're actually ahead of them. And we're only five points from first. And, you know, like we were getting laughed at out the room, right? I heard Sky Sports play, um, what is it, Pundits, Sky Carver. He was saying like, oh, you know, Tommy Osu, he's not a right back. He's not a centre back. So it's like, what is he, mate? I've been seeing him getting tagged all over Twitter now, asking, so do you know what position he plays now? <laughs> <laughs> These dickhead journalists will do anything for us. But while we're here, guys, um, if you are enjoying, obviously, the chat with Harry, and before we talk a little bit more about his team structure, do hit like, hit subscribe. And just while we get a drink, I'm going to show you a very fun moment because we have a lot of clips here on Net That Hall from previous episodes, and we're going to find something to clip of you, Harry, I'm sure. We'll make you do something in outrage. But in the meantime, this was the episode with uh, obviously Nick Triggerlips. Um, it was a Monday night like this time. And I think Hibbo's reaction tonight was as passionate as Nick's reaction back then when Gray scored. That's Can't devastating. Make some help. I bet livefpl.net is going to crash. Let's have a look. Oh, wow. The average and the safety score have gone way up. <laughs> Having this hour out and then having that prick grey score, it's just like <laughs> ruin my fucking day, though. <laughs> you know, you get it's ruined my day too, to be fair. All, all ten midfielders blank, don't they? And you just know that fucking grey is going to come along and fuck up your grey week. Game on a Monday like night. <laughs> Except all the pricks on Twitter who all got him. That's Everyone's the only people you were. Every ninety-nine percent of people posting on Twitter tonight will have him. All, all the, the wild rest, card is all the game rest will have turned off. Okay, we... I don't know if you've seen that before, Harry, but it's a have. famous Sanchez got ever. booked. Oh, you're lying. I was just about to go check my live rank and you In say the that. 97th minute of having an argument with James MacArthur. What a guy. I got 41 points in the end. I'll take his three points, though. It looked, oh, no, he wait, not he won't be three, and he might even lose his bonus point. You might even be on one. I was yeah, going to say, what did he do? You celebrate getting a bonus point? Had an argument. <laughs> oh, no. What a guy. Um, but I've still gone up, Frank. But no, that was before. Yeah. Not gone up in total. Just minimised my red arrow, I mean. But <laughs> it's still deep red. Let's um, kind of just look at this team before we move on then to the Twitter submitted questions next and the live Q&A from the audience. So one question I have is, you've obviously got Sar in here. And... Yeah, I'm just thinking about that because for me, like obviously, if you got him say two games to go, this run of three games was, looks ideal. Yeah, um, would you still keep him on a wild card then, and look to who would you move him to? Like, would an Arsenal defender interest you? Because we were talking about Ramsdale originally, I guess, and to tie it back to Arsenal, like some people talk about Saka and Smith Rowe, would you be looking at those kind of players more so than Ramsdale, or do you think if Ramsdale is the first choice keeper, as I was saying, like for the time being, would you just go for him and only have the one Arsenal player? I like Saka in place of Saar in this team, if you can afford. But I suppose if we look at the structure of this team, you're going to be playing four at the back every week with Trent, Rudiger, Alonso, Cancelo. 
And then you're going to be playing three up front every week with Lukaku, Antonio, and in this case, Ings, but it could be any forwards you wanted to. The point of this draft is that you have three cheap midfielders that you rotate and you play two of them every week. So in theory, Rafinha would play every week because you wouldn't dare bench him ever again. And then the other ones would be either Ben Rama or Saar. And in theory, you could play them based on fixture. So, and then you'd have a good first sub every week because we've seen with the likes of, you know, the past couple of weeks has been a fair bit of rotation. And then, you know, if there's Champions League rotation for Alonso, for example, you've got someone like Saar or Ben Rama as your first sub every week. So this team allows you to be very flexible and have a very good sub and just target the fixtures every single week. No, I like that. Um, I've had a bit of a rank drop since we last spoke. Yep. 7.2K to 7.4K. Harry, where did you see this thing about the yellow card for Sanchez? It's on uh, Sofa Score, 97th minute. Yeah, I'm on FPLGameWeek.com. And thanks to them, they've added Net That Hall now as a channel to the Content Creators League. And I was very humble for that. But when we get bigger as a channel, hopefully all four co hosts can join. But they're one Wait. of my favorite channels. Why is he having an argument there? That's, that's just. <laughs> yeah, no, on FPL Game Week, have a look, guys. Um, like, I've just clicked on like a player in my team. And in the Content Creators League, I was ahead by like 15 points, I think. And now that is down to one point on uh, FPL Mate. Always cheating is like 12 points behind. And then you've got a few interesting mm. players that we all know. Look, it's kind of Rich Clark. Andy, let's talk FPL. Neil from Scout. It's got you as well, Tips. Number seven, you're there competing with me. Um, I feel so good that I've come here and I've invited you on just to throw my rank at you in your worst game week ever. Thank he got, thanks. So I'm just looking at this Sanchez yellow card. He got booked after the final whistle. What a fucking knob. Like, I'm, 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 I'm looking, right? And see, live score doesn't have the yellow card. And the like, super score, super score doesn't has... have it either. It's still having one three. They've removed it on fplgameweek.com, though. That's what's interesting. So if you go there, that's why I even brought them up in the first place. Like Sanchez is on two points. But um, uh, on that see, note, if he cost me, me, if he cost me, me green arrow, I'll not be. I'm seeing them. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about not tilting and rage transfers, but I like that this is the reaction on air. I'm going to clip that too. Um, so we have the Twitter questions, guys. Um, the first one's from FPL Mariner, who couldn't be here with us. Obviously, he's hosting the matchups show. Um, he's back from his visit to Germany as well with his son. So I think they had a great time there. But he says Southampton made it really tough for City. Do you think they can make it tough for Chelsea? And obviously you've brought in Lukaku to captain him. So we'll do these Twitter questions quickfire. And obviously anyone who missed it and is here now, you can look back on the VOD and there's a lot of other kind of Harry's thoughts about these questions in general, yeah. I'm sure. I I think in theory they can make it difficult. They set up very well. They are strong defensively. But we saw how... Jimenez bullied both their centre backs, you know, especially when he scored. Can you imagine what Lukaku has the capability of doing when he does it against practically any centre back, you know, that he plays against has a very difficult time against him. So I think, yes, they have a difficult, you know, City showed it is possible to play, you know, impress us very well, which no team has done before. They'll probably try and go something, you know, impress us very well, sit quite deep, but. I do expect us to create chances against them. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, do you want to alternate then here, boys, as we go through the questions? Yeah, go ahead. Flick you through that. Like, I'm still kind of talking here. <laughs> uh, they're saying that uh, Blue Nix 99 another friend of the show, just um, to put it up, he's saying we're moaning about this Sanchez Yellow and he's jumping off a cliff as a Gaeta owner with the goal. That's true. Well, he shouldn't own Gaeta. Well, we should know Sanchez, though, should we? <laughs> <laughs> I know that. I know that. Who's next here? This is FPL Planner Australia. This guy, I think he's called. So he says, out of Ronaldo, Jada, Greenwood, who would you transfer out this week for free? He's thinking Ronaldo, the or Lukaku captain, or Greenwood, Jada for Ben Rama. That's quite. Difficult. I my, I've ne- I haven't owned Jota all season, and I'm quite glad I haven't. Now he scored points, but I'm glad I haven't had to deal with the stress of Jota each week about having to deal with him missing chances. Will he will he start? Everything like that. I don't particularly think he's going to start against Man City this week. Although he could, 
is Firmino fit? We don't fully know how. Is he going to throw him straight back in against City? Is that really going to happen? And then he's got Watford the week after. So I'd probably look to sell. Again, it depends on what happens with the United lineup. If if Greenwood doesn't start again, then he's probably going to start the weekend. And he was, I think, top for shots in that game out of anyone. So, and I, if you've got other players in your team that you want to transfer, I don't necessarily think Ronaldo to Lukaku is a worthwhile transfer. If you've got other things you'd want to do, I'd probably, I'm, I'm favouring selling one of the midfielders out of these three. And for Ben Rama. The, the combination of Ben Rama and Ronaldo or Jota and R- Lukaku is a very tight one. This could go anyway. Um, I pro- right, I'll probably go Lukaku. I'd probably do the Ronaldo to Lukaku, actually, because I don't think Ben Rama, when they've got Europa League, once all those midfielders are fit, I wonder if that rotation is coming slight with him. He scored one in four, and then you can assess what to do with Jota and Greenwood. I was forward, disappointed I as a Ben Rama and Greenwood only this weekend because yeah. obviously the likes of Rafinha, Saar, Gray, they all outscored them. Gallagher, everyone did it, and my midfielders didn't, and my captain Ronaldo blanked. So I'm looking at tilt. I'm looking to do Ronnie to Romelu as well. Yeah. But now I'm wondering if what you said is right, which is I could keep Ronaldo this week, which was the original plan, and yeah. just sell one of Jotaro Greenwood, but not for Ben Rama, maybe for Rafinha. Yeah. That's what I'm leaning towards. Um. There is also the Cancelo move, which is on my eyes as a shore owner, but I think we have to wait to see how he's doing. Um, yeah, just... don't particularly want Cancelo this week. I think there's probably other things. That's what I mean. So, is it could I, I could do um, Ronaldo and do the Jota or Greenwood downgrade to Rafinha? Yeah, yeah. Or I could just do one move, so I could just keep Ronaldo, captain him, and have two transfers again the following week. But I feel like that's just getting way too patient now, and I'm like, I just want to blow my load, use both the transfers. I'm, I've been so patient. I've taken three transfers this season, Harry. That is very patient. Yeah, yeah that's all I've taken. No, obviously, three transfers, no his. I've got my first red arrow now. I'm like, fuck yeah, I've been sitting around watching everything happen around me yeah. for too long. Like, I need to buy some fucking assets. Like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You, you've, actually, you've actually done really well this season. It's my best start in nine years. I think similar to what Harry's saying. And that's what worries me about what Triggerlip said when he came on. He said previous seasons when we say like we were 500k or 1 million or 2 million at this stage, everyone else who was an engaged manager like on Twitter, they were also in a similar point. Whereas this season, it's like the community as a whole, as you said, Harry, they've had a better season than we've ever seen before. And I don't know if it's the rise of like, say, content creators and what you were saying earlier, where like people are like, what's the team? Is this final? Because everyone's copying. And I think if the likes of, say, Andy, Let's Talk FPL or other big accounts like FPL Family have like a bad season one year, lots of ranks will go down. So I don't know what you think, A, about that. Because before we go into Dom's question on screen, I'm just interested to know, like, do you think that nowadays it's really hard to compete because there's just so much information and even people who were casual before, they, they know who to buy, right? Yeah, and it was very apparent last season. If someone like Andy or, you know, Mark, the general, have good seasons, if you are competing at the same sort of rank as Andy or just behind him, it then makes your season harder because there are other managers. There are much more sort of managers in that sort of space because there are people who do just have the same team as him. So, yeah, I do think it's impacting it a little bit. There are much more switched on. You know, views for everyone is going up. Listening to podcasts is going up, everything like that. So it is getting more difficult every year because of how engaged people are coming becoming. Yeah, no, I think that, that's really interesting. Do you have any thoughts on that, Hibber, before we go back to the questions? No, we'll just we'll leave on dive on that questions here. Go for it. So this this next question is from Dom Nine Black Dragon. So he's saying TAA a must. Or can that money be spread, Ken, in terms of forwards and midfield? So for me, I got asked this the other day. I still think he's a must because he's the for me, he's the only defender that is continuously as explosive as him. I think on a given game week you can, you know, match him, but it's the fact that he has the ability for those, you know, 15 or even higher point holes, which I don't see you getting from any other defender very often you know you might get it from Cancelo once you might get it from Alonso once but Trent will score double digits more than any other defender this season which I think is that explosive point for me and 
because I'm not a fan of three premiums, I, you've got the money to do it. Um, so I would still go earning Trent. I can see people going a little bit towards double Chelsea, double Man City. But I think that Liverpool defence is still very good. So I think they are probably the third best defence, well, are the third best defence in the league. If not, you know, up there with the other two. So I, I would still be keeping them. Thank God Brighton didn't win today. Sorry to any Brighton fans, because if they had, they would have been first, right? Yeah. What's the story about this yellow card? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> is this going to come? Is this going to come off FPL score? Wait, they've taken it off his score. Yeah. On the actual FPL game, he's got a yellow they've card. Taken it off on a FPLgameweek.com. Yeah. Well, I'd rag Maybe the official FPL tower's got it wrong, and because it was after the whistle in the official game, it doesn't count. Let's see. Oh, Bruno Maybe. once scored after the end of an official game, and they gave him those points, didn't they? That's what I'm trying to say. There's been some <laughs> mad stuff happening, and he also got an assist where he didn't touch the ball because if they'd admitted he didn't touch the ball, it would have been offside. So I was fuming. I was fuming. That kind of shit cost me ranks. <laughs> yeah. It did. Yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. The ranks is updated now. Oh, has it? No, I think I'm still 7.4 or worse. Yeah, yeah 7.4. Either way, I'm, I'm just inside the top 100k. So. I'm, I need I'm to check my Sky, guys. So before we go on to the rest of the questions, I've started Sky this season for the first time and we're in the like hub WhatsApp group and I was like, look, guys, they were like, we love how your team is open. And I was like, what do you mean? They're like, well, everyone else in the top like 100 or 1,000, they've hidden their teams. And I don't even know how you hide your team. So my team's just publicly visible. I've used one transfer only. Um, I've had a look. I've gone down a bit. I was at 16 OR in the world at one point. So 16th, that's correct for the podcast listeners, in case you're wondering. And now I'm 34th. So I, I don't know what's going on, but I've had one transfer out of 40 used, Thibaut, and I didn't buy Gallagher tonight. And I don't know, like Sky's got different rules, but... It's 50 grand first place prize and is this, I'm now hitting my team and I'm going to ask for advice from people. Like, what should I is, do? Is this your first year playing Sky? It is. And my second team is even 400 rank. And both of them have a chance at um, the money. And I kept giving up on my uh, second team because it was like 1,000 or two, 3,000 while my other team was, say, 100 before. And people were messaging me saying, don't burn that bridge. Sometimes your second team ends up being the one that finishes higher. So I remember that. So I've been I've been playing it like FPL, like you know. Um, I've got the twelve fan team entries. They're all in the money, but they've dropped off now because I captained Ronaldo twelve times in them this week, and I didn't differentiate, and it's fucked me in every format. But while all my life in FPL and fan team has gone wrong, as you say, it's still a great start. So I feel I need to stop going on tilt and be patient and do what Harry's doing. Buy the players that they're going to get me kind of to avoid a wild card now, rather than buying one week punts. And then in Sky, that's made up the bitter kick to the face this week from the Red Arrows because somehow I'm 30-something in the world, as I said, 34th. And now I'm looking to go on to win it. No, no, I'm calling it here. This will be clipped. If I win it, it will be played. If I lose, I'm sure it will be played and I'll be taunted. But either What's way... What's going to happen? Are you, are you, are you going to go and do like a, a pod with Dan Cox and just leave me? <laughs> He would love to hear that. Um, he's about to hit 1,000 subs like us. And I was telling him like how the YouTube ads, they help you like buy like a coffee once a month and stuff. And then they pay you in like six months. But I'm sure Harry's more <laughs> successful than all of us. Maybe he gets a whole uh, subway with his coffee. Yeah, you, can exactly. go down, you, you go down to the coffee shop and you basically show them that you're on YouTube and they just let you have free coffee for six months until you can until you get the money from YouTube. That's, that's what I I'll, heard. I'll pay you in six months once I get paid. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that 20 cent a day or whatever yeah. but um, it is good times at least it helps cover some of the costs because obviously it's all for fun as you say and I think it is quite incredible how you've grown it all just out of um, the passion of it rather than kind of it doesn't need to cover any of our livelihoods here so we just do it because we love it exactly so let's go back to the Twitter questions before we go to the live chat because I think there's a lot of people with lots of questions and dilemmas and we've kept you for an hour and 33 you made the common mistake of saying you had no hard stops. So <laughs> you've done well. You're here, but we're going to get to the live Q&A soon enough. Um, <laughs> so from here, just um, we've got James Stevenson underscore on Twitter. I think he's saying, is pairing Laporte with Cancelo for a game week eight wildcard a viable solution to tr double up on the City defence and save 0.6 million? Or is it too risky? So I've looked at Laporte a little bit. And I don't quite know what's happened to Stones, but he seems to be Laporte's place to lose, doesn't it? He doesn't seem to be playing Stones very much. He favours that left foot that Laporte has. 
um, I think is a big thing. He didn't play that well last season, so he went with Stones, but he loves a tried and tested centre-back pairing. Um, and he seems to have found it again in Laporte. Laporte on that left side is working very well. The issue is you wouldn't be surprised if it... It's a bit like Alonso and Chilwell. You wouldn't be surprised at all if suddenly Stones is starting again. I don't think anyone will be shocked if that happened. The other one is Carl Walker as well seems to be playing a lot of minutes um, and seems to be playing very well. Zinchenko doesn't seem to be getting a look in. Um, so could you go there? I'm just a bit worried that, you know, we see a back four, which is Cancelo, Diaz, Zinchenko, Stones, which could be very possible and happened a lot last season. I don't necessarily think um, Laporte or Walker are bad picks. But if I was on a wild card, I'd want to go Diaz because it could just go horribly wrong if you don't. Yeah, no, I think that that's a very good point. And I wouldn't be looking to save the 0.6 million. Just before we do go on to Akash's question from you, Hibbo, there's been some talk from Blue Danube guy in the chat. And he says Trent Alexander-Arnold hasn't travelled with the no. Liverpool squad to the Porto game. And what, what do we think about that? Because you would have thought it's a tough game away from home against Porto and maybe they would take him if he was fit. So is that a genuine concern or does that change what we were saying to James's well, I'll tell uh, you, I'll tell, question? I'll tell, I'll tell you what I would do right now because obviously we're waiting to see and the extent of Shaw's injury and if, and, and if he's going to have travelled. But the fact that he has man Sarai, if he's carrying an injury, if I'm going to wild card in game week eight, I'm probably going to sell Trent on a one-week punt. And then, no, well... See, see the way things are now, I think I'm definitely going to wild card in game week eight because I kind of want to press on. And if Trent's missing out this week, Man City wasn't a great fixture for him anyway. I could I could get I could get somebody on a spot instead and try and press on a wee bit. It would give me a bit of bank. They maybe do something a bit different too. But um Yeah. I I would be so I've been looking on, on Twitter a little bit. So a few things have been said that, you know, first of all, it's just a rest. They're resting him for City this weekend. Then, as someone just said in the chat, he trained with the squad today. There's been other little bits that maybe had a small knock and they decided not to take a risk with him because their focus is City this weekend. Again, I'd be surprised if he doesn't play this weekend. But for me, for example, like I've got Ben White at the moment sat happily waiting to come in away at and Brighton. Roberto as well. Yeah, so well, Livermento's got Chelsea. Yeah, so. Not a good game, but he's still there as a like. If you yeah. need a sub, I would. Start and the thing ready. is, Trent is like hundred percent owned every week, almost ninety percent owned in the top hundred k. So Trent being out every week doesn't really bother me that much because I know my squad depth is good enough to deal with these sort of things. But I, I wouldn't be worried if you own him. I, I imagine he'll be fine. Nice one. Do you want to go? I would have a double Brighton defence against Arsenal. Shaw flagged, Trent, Trent possibly flagged, <laughs> Ailing flagged, and Lovermento playing. Who's, who's he playing? Chelsea. Chelsea. What, what the hell? Is he allowed You're to play against an Chelsea? Early wild card. Are you going to say? So this is a perfect question for you, Akash. Akash is asked. Look, he's asked about. So what Akash's question is: Will card game week seven or game week eight? And I'm sorry, and just to answer your question, we sold Lovermento, so he is allowed to oh, play. Right. All oh, right, is there a buyback? I don't know. I think we I heard we have so many right backs. There probably <laughs> is. We own half of Europe at this stage, so I think like a cash's question. It's all kind of team dependent, and unless I can see his team, it's hard for me to say well he should well care in game week seven or game week eight. And I would. So what are you gonna do? Because you sound like your defense. You just read it out. I'm going to do what I do all the time. I'm going to, well, this season, I didn't do it in previous seasons. I'm going to wait until Friday and see how I'm fixed. I don't, yeah, I don't, I, I, ne I never, yeah. never, never used to do this, but I'm going to wait to Friday and see if they say, look, Ailing's fit to play against Watford. Shaw eating too much bread and pasta. He's all right. Trent, there's nothing wrong with him. But Shaw's been terrible ever since we seen that menu where he had like bread starter and pasta for his main. Oh, he had like double carbs and he's never recovered. He's, but he was so he's, he was such a like part of the like, kind of game week one template. And you think about yeah. say like say like Marner's magic where like pre season Marner was saying Man City defense, Chelsea defense, and like everybody went kind of united defense and like 
Man City and Chelsea have kind of so I saw up. another stat here, but um, United have kept one clean sheet in the last 14 games in the league. I can't, I'm so happy I've sold Luke Shaw. I need to I, get him up. Maybe he's the one I sell, but I can't go to Cancelo this wait. week, and that's why I'm stuck. What do I do, Harry? Yeah. No, I'm not trying some money to get Cancelo in. No, as in I can do it, but it's early to go. So now well, you missed the price rise on him now. So and also there's the fixture as well. I'm I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say Cancelo against Chelsea or against Liverpool. No way. That's what I mean. It's tough. So I thought the decision of would you start Ben White or Cancelo this week? No, no, but I'm not starting Ben White either. I'm starting. No, that's my dilemma. Oh, oh, oh Ben White, Cancelo, Cancelo, always Cancelo. That's what I think, but. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Brighton away won't be easy. No, Man, well, it's got like zero upside. I know, but what I do want to say is we were talking about Tony earlier, and I found it hilarious how like Ben White got slaughtered by the media for like not being able to handle Tony, and when Tony absolutely destroyed and bodied the likes of um, Matip and Van Dijk, was it? Not yeah. heard a peep since then. Um, it definitely shows that like, the hatred and vitriol towards our club, like I said, with Sky Carver saying Tommy Osti wasn't a right back or a centre back, and they they just love it, but. I, but the I media, yeah, they hate the, us. The, the media, when it comes to Liverpool defence, are just embarrassing because they, they started this whole narrative about like nobody's ever dribbled past Van Dijk. Like, Jesus, I never seen anything as stupid in my life. Because anytime somebody ran at him, he just kind of he, he backpedaled all the time. And you're like, well, nobody can roll past you when you're backing up to your net. What are you talking about? It's like, no. <laughs> But like Van Dijk, I thought Tony gave him, gave him the run around, to be honest. I, yeah, he did. Know. Tony's looking great recently. I'm, I'm on the air. The I'm ball comes him. up on the air. Like Tony, Tony, Tony does good. Like, you know, and, and Wemo's always rolling for the flick on. Hmm. Just going to the last question then from FPL Banger before we go to the live viewers. Um, so he says, Mwemo or Gallagher? And does the Ferran <laughs> Torres experience put you off Man City Mints in general? So I never went. Uh, we'll start with the first one in Buemo or Gallagher. Gallagher got an assist today. I would probably favour Gallagher a little bit, but I don't I'd probably go Smith Rowe over either of them at the moment. Because of the fixtures. If the fixtures were the same for all three, I'd probably go in Buemo. But their I run's think, pretty difficult. And I have Tony, as I said, so like I personally wouldn't be going then for a second Brentford attacker. Yeah. And I wouldn't be looking to sell Tony for Armstrong unless I'm wildcarding, I don't think. I do like Southampton's fixtures after the wild card. So mm-hmm. if you had that, that makes sense. Um, yeah. So just before then, on the Man City side of things, does the Ferran Torres experience put you off them? I did, fortunately didn't go on the Man City, on the Ferran Torres experiment. And it's, although I made a bad decision of um, benching Rafinha this week, my best decision I've made so far this season was going into game week four. I had a choice of taking a minus four to sell Simicaz in order to get Jota. I could have got Adama Traore. I could have got Andre Gray. I could have got Torres. But I went with Saar. Um, and going Saar is obviously paid off very well. I, I just don't know where on earth I'd go in that Man City attack again. They score so many goals from so many different points in their attack again that I'm quite happy not owning their attack at the moment. How, how do you um, feel about uh, Grealish before we leave this topic? Because actually just talking about our team. So I'm looking at short to Cancelo potentially early even though yeah. I know people are saying he wouldn't do it with that fixture and mm-hmm. Ronaldo to Lukaku. Or I could keep Shaw this week and I could do that Ronaldo to Lukaku and one of Jota or Greenwood to Rafinha mm. or, or Saar or Smith Rowe, Saka, as we were saying earlier as well. But then the, the plan I would have is that I could then in the following weeks, I could also look to then get Grealish. So I feel like at about 8 million, like I don't know if he's someone I would want. So maybe I just have one Chelsea defender, one City defender, and Grealish. So instead of upgrading one of my worst defenders, like my fourth one, to say um, a second City or second Chelsea defender, do I just turn someone like a Saar into a Grealish instead with that same funds? And does, and does that then put me off the back four altogether? I think at the moment Grealish looks overpriced. Yeah, I agree. Nice. Assist the assister. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> they can they'll score winger. goals, but he doesn't look like he's going to haul anytime soon and he'll get a rest occasionally once everyone's back fit when there's Champions League and everything I just at 8 million he's not better he's not 2 million better than a lot of those other cheap mids that you'd go for at the moment I don't think there was a bit of discussion about this on Twitter like Praz I'm friendly way on Twitter they were talking about say kind of Chelsea compared to Man City and they were saying about say doubling up in defence and Praz was saying he'd be happy to double up and say Chelsea defence because in terms of attack he would only want Lukaku 
but he wouldn't be so keen on doubling up on, say, Man City defence because it would limit him in terms of having two attackers. But like I'm looking at Man City at the moment and going, I'm not really sure I could pick two attackers, even if there was a double game week. I'm not sure which two attackers I could, I could pick out of Man City. Like, where, like, no. where, where, do you, where do you stand that? I'd probably go Jesus as one of them. Right. And apart from that, I probably wouldn't know. Cheaper than Vardy, I guess. And Vardy's been killing it. And yeah. We'll see what happens. And I guess he's kind of maybe cemented his role in the winger position. But again, yeah. with, with kind of the Champions League, it's hard to know. Yeah, definitely. What all these clubs are going to do. And that's why someone like a Saka on that note does appeal to me a bit. Because yeah. he's not going to have those midweek games. And I do wonder if that's quite a nice position to be in. Um, now, just to go to the questions then from the live viewers in the chat, I think... If anyone who's can here, I I can I ask you something before we move on live chat? Because yeah, of course, you're like Mister Arsenal. What about Obama Yang going back to play centre forward? So I'd get him in formats like Sky, where he's got a Monday and a Friday game, and I can captain him in both, and it's like back to back as well. So you can do like one transfer, get the two matches out of him, and then transfer him out for another player who plays on Saturday or Sunday and captain them too. But I'll have him in every other format basically, but. I just would not at this stage have him yet. I think I want to be sure that Lacazette is not going to play centre forward. What's always worried me is that Arteta's played with these different teams. I do think now for the three games in a row, we've seen basically a similar starting lineup. Yeah. And I think the only interchangeable place there is Smith Rowe and Pepe. I think those two will probably rotate because what Odegaard does is too important. And if Oba continues to play centre forward, I worry like would Laka compete with him for that spot? Or what's the case there, right? Because there is no Europe. And Laka is a pretty expensive striker of ours. And he's only played maybe like, I think, 54 competitive minutes this season. Yeah. Like maybe 90, including the last League Cup. So, like, w- surely he's going to want to play at some point, right? And that worries me because then one man can go to the wing. On the flip side, I will just say that at the price he is, I think it was under 10 million because of a price drop. It's the cheapest Aubameyang has ever been in any kind of fantasy game in a decade. And he had his one bad year last year. But the reality is before that, he never had like a below 20 goal season. And his worst season was 15 goals. And that was with kind of malaria, his mum almost dying, leaving to go deal with that issue. And then, so I do wonder if this new kind of look Arsenal team play in a way that he's the centre forward and Lacazette's just a sub and he's always going to play a striker. It could work out quite well but he would be a big punt that's what i would say um like would you really pick him over a ronaldo or lukaku right now yeah definitely definitely not but i'm kind of thinking maybe want to keep an eye on as the season kind of goes on if he's going to at some point have a really nice run where he plays norwich or somebody absolutely shite like it could be something to punt on like you know if he's going to play centre forward he never appealed to me when he played left wing obviously i know we're going off on a bit of a tangent here but i was just interested to get get your thoughts and on that, because I know he is playing kind of more central now at the moment. Um. Yeah, of course. Um, so we've got some of the questions have come in. Um, I'm going to start with the first one, actually. And this one is quite an interesting one, just to talk a little bit more about Man City as, as it's been a common topic recently. So Raman Effin says, with kind of what's going on, would you think Bernardo Silva looks nailed Then is he any good? Um, I've seen people talk about him on Twitter as well today, and I'm not really buying it. Like, it's what you said about Asper Equator, like, I feel like he's been around. He wanted to leave in pre-season. I know he'll play potentially because of what's going on, but would you really want him? Not at all. Um, Never in a million years. No. Yeah, like it, yeah, it wouldn't cross my mind. Um, we'll do these quick fires. So we've got um, Fahim is asking. I think they want to buy Cancelo and Alonso by selling Trent and Shaw. Now, I, like I wouldn't personally do. I, it's rare for me to do one defensive transfer, let alone two. And if it's for a hit, I wouldn't do it. If it was two free transfers and he's looking to do Ronaldo to Lukaku like next week, then I could see the appeal if he didn't have a Chelsea defender. But even in that case, I would be getting Rudiger and Cancelo if that was the two moves and it was free transfers. What, what do you think? I'm not a big fan of selling Trent personally. I can understand selling Shaw, but... I would want to know the kind of thinking behind selling Trent. Is he selling Trent because of this possible injury or is he selling Trent just to kind of fund these moves? Because... He's got Man City, I agree, but after that, the fixtures are kind of, they're still fairly good for Liverpool. And I think when you look at him at 7.5 and that bracket and you compare him to, say, options in midfield, Greenwoods and Giannis of the world, Trent's good value. Like, he is going to do 
160, 170, 180. He probably needs to do 180 points to be some decent bit of value, but he's got the potential to do it. You know, it's I, I'm not sure I would make that move. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. either. As to chaos, any update on Bamford? Not that we know. Nothing yet. Yeah, nothing official. Think. Nothing official. But we, I had heard through the great minds, and don't quote me on this, that he was out for a while. And that, that does worry me as somebody who's looking to bring in Rafinha. And by a while, mm. I mean about four weeks. Obviously, the only thing we knew was that he was out of this weekend that just went. And that's the only kind of guaranteed information. But um, just a few more bits. So we have something around kind of Mendy and for Sanchez just from Fahim will quickly answer this one. Um, n- not for me. Like I wouldn't spend that money and you're obviously a Chelsea fan. And what, what do you think? Would you do that? I wouldn't do that. I start off, it's too much for a goalkeeper. And secondly, in we have the sec- we have the best backup goalkeeper in the league by, I would say, a considerable way with Kepa. He is really starting to show why we paid the money for him. He will get the occasional minute. We saw it at the end of last season. He also will play when we lose Mendy to the African Cup of Nations. You don't want to have to be making a goalkeeper transfer when that comes around because you will have other players like Salah that you'll have to get rid of. So I would go into our defence before I went for Mendy. Yeah, Where I'm sitting on Mendy is number one goalkeeper transfers outside of wildcard or criminal. Like, yeah. As Sanchez is really doing that bad at four and a half compared to the additional, like how are you funding that? Does that money in the bank? Like I would, I would rather have Sanchez and spend the money than, than, than you know, move to say Mendy and lose out that additional. Say what? What is he like six or five and a half? Six. Just, it just you could have it's Sanchez and mean, you know Rudiger or Alonso, or you could have you know Mendy and Eight. Veltman. And Mendy's always, as you said, he's got that risk of like you turn on your TV and keep us playing. And you, you yeah. basically do need a playing sub keeper if you go for Mendy, which takes your spending keepers to 10.5, which is again, yeah, I agree, criminal. Yeah, so. That's a lot of money, yeah, that's too much. Um, we'll do a couple of last questions before we go. This is another Chelsea question while we have you here, Harry. Um, so what do you think about Ziesh as a differential option? Um, and has he had a falling out with the manager? It sounds like, I uh, mean, maybe it's a rumor. I believe, I don't believe he has, and I don't know where that's come from at all, um, but I wouldn't be going anywhere near any of our midfielders at the moment. Um, because of the way we play, there is so many people toying for so few positions out of those attacking midfielders that I wouldn't go anywhere near him. But I absolutely don't believe that he's had a falling out with Tuchel at all. He's had a great preseason. He started the season well. He just happens to rotate with mount particularly in that position and then also on the other side Habits and Werner are also wanting minutes as well so I wouldn't be going anywhere near any Chelsea midfielder Lukaku up front and the defence and draft I, and do you play FPL draft no I don't no I have I mount in FPL draft like what, what should I should I sell no, I mean no, I, don't, I draft different I don't know who you can yeah. get draft slightly different if you can get a decent mid instead of him I probably would. If you can do it as a trade with someone who's sentimental about Mount, there's a guy. There's a guy as a Chelsea fan. I might. I might suck her hand. Yeah, yeah, these draft tactics are different. Like you got to like warm those Mail people's emotions. Yeah, <laughs> I have Fuck so the many strings. players, isn't it? Yeah, because no yeah. one else will buy players from your team. We'll give you a couple of last questions. I, I only remember this one up. I'm not going to answer the whole thing, but they ask us about Tierney, and I've seen his name in quite a few. People are saying, you know, back fours, but with Tierney instead of double City, double Chelsea. What are your thoughts on that? I don't think it's bad. I think that Arsenal defence is fine. And I like Cash as an option as well, which is also mentioned there. But are they going to keep as many clean sheets as Chelsea and City? No. Is the attacking threat that they're going to get going to make bridge the gap? Probably not either. So I don't think so. I think they're fine if you don't have the money, but I would be looking to free up the money to go up to the more expensive ones. Sounds good. Just a last one from Leonardo. Um, well, who's the best enabling 6.5 forward? So obviously St. Maxim has been famously doing well the start of this season. Armstrong is a strong contender for those on wildcard. And Tony is one that many of us sold, but others held on to, and now we're not looking to sell anymore. But what would you pick out of those three if you had to kind of only have one? Across the season... 
I think Tony will be the highest scoring of those three. Um, the only issue is, is I pretty sure I haven't looked at it that much, but their fixture run is starting to become a little bit dreadful. No, um, it's, 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 it's about to pass the bad parts. Yeah. West they Ham, Chelsea, Leicester, Burnley. The West Ham, Chelsea, three, Leicester in the next three. The next three aren't ideal, but what I will say, like, I'm, like I, I, I'm holding Tony at the moment. West Ham, I've no fear of West Ham. Chelsea, yeah, obviously, it's not a great yeah, matchup. Not great. Leicester, like Leicester, Leicester, Kimmy, Leicester, Kimmy, the fan for shit at the moment. And like, yeah. because I own Tony, like, I, I'm not sure I would buy Tony ahead of this run, but owning Tony, I'm not actually looking to move him out because. Yeah. From and what then, I've seen him do, I think he could do something in those couple of mm. games. The next and then he has run. the dream fixture run of yeah, Burnley, Norwich, Newcastle in 10, 11, 12. So over the next three, I think St. Maximin's fixtures are not bad. Um, but I'd probably back Tony over the long term. I like that. Just another question about a Chelsea player and another Chelsea player just not playing for Chelsea this season. Mount or Gallagher? Gallagher. Gallagher, yeah, but I think I would do the same as we said about the Chelsea mids. Um, a final question from Ram and Nathan before we wrap up for the night and let Harry go. Um, what do you think about Podence? Obviously, he's back. I heard he had a really bad game, and it's meant Traore owners are really optimistic now of getting a two pointer next week don't, instead of one point. Don't, don't be buying, don't be buying, no boys like Podence. Like, you know, <laughs> don't be buying any Wolves midfielders. Don't go tell near them, them. Tell them about X minutes. Yeah. I, see Pones. See last year I played my wild card in game week four. I bought Pones. It was the single worst decision I made last season. I'm not even joking. Me, I like looked I at I, me, I, I like looked at me midfield and I had like Foden and Pones, and I used to call them Pones and Foden's or something like that. And I was like, oh, Rodents. I was like, how did I get like a midfield as bad as this? Like I played my wild card from a team that was half decent, and then I spent weeks making transfers to try and fix my wild card. No, don't be saying Pones. <laughs> yeah, don't be signing him. I like that. I'm gonna have to find that to clip and time stuff. Yeah. Just, just before we go, um, Ramanathan says just as a counterpoint for any podcast listeners, um, West Ham, Leicester, and Burnley is actually probably good with a uh, kind of Tony perspective. So we're all saying it's tough, but I think as owners we can't sell. But if you weren't owning him, I wouldn't get him yet. I agree. I think with that. he's tricky. I think he's tricky in a game we get well cared because he's got the Chelsea factor. And like I'm going to well cared in game we get, I'm going to look at that Chelsea factor and be like. Ah, uh, it's a sore one. And maybe Armstrong will have a better fixture. I think he does have a good game with gate fixture. Yeah, and I think so. Th- that's going to be a tight one for me to kind of decide, well, could I pick somebody else and move him on? But I don't want to pre-book transfers. I'll have to decide. It's, that's a it, could, it, 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 yeah. could, it could be a good reason not to well card in game we get because... Just you whatever just, you do, if you're wild you carding, don't buy opponents. You could, to be fair, that know. week, your cheap defender will likely have a good fixture in game week eight because you have Arsenal at home to Palace and you have Southampton. They are home to Leeds, I suppose. But, but, you but probably, still, I could play either of those. You could get away with owning Tony, and I probably would. And if you didn't want to play him, you could bench him that week. No, solid. That's a People good point. Thanks, thanks. The stream's been amazing. Yeah, thank you, Harry. I'd really, I'd really warms my well, probably heart out there, like, you know. Yeah, no, we, we we appreciate you coming on and staying here for two hours. We'll let you go before it gets any later. But um, these guys want to sell Treore too. So um, I don't know whether we've helped him or not, but good luck to you, Ram and Nathan. I hope we all get back to Green Arrows next week after a great start. Yeah, whoa, 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 bug man. I have a Green Arrow. <laughs> <laughs> not after that Sanchez yellow card, you don't. Oh, do you? I do. I'm up. I'm it's up to eighty four. Okay. I'm up to eighty four k boys. It's every week, green arrow. I haven't had a. I haven't had a red arrow. You managed to post it on Twitter. You know how them ten captaincy streaks get you. Like, Aye, I'm. I'm. Away. I'm doing this. I'm going to call this the green arrow streak. I'm just going to like screenshot my green arrows and be all. Who's got the same boys? No. Yeah, keep shit doing like it and see no. until no one else has it on Twitter. So I can't believe we have OR number. What was it? Thirteen in the world in the league. I rank one. It's a shame he's not Irish. He sounds Irish. I think he's. I think. I think he's English. But there's there's been a few kind of big ranking players have joined the last week. Thirteenth. There's a guy who's about fiftieth as well. You know. So. I love it. Um, before we go uh, to Sartak, who's asking about Shorter Rudiger. If you who's watch back the VOD, if you missed it, you'll be able to hear a lot of our thoughts on those kind of moves as well. But thank you, everyone. And um, Harry, I'm going to play the intro to get us out after this. But um, just before I do. Is there anything you want to say just to the kind of listeners and where can they find you as well? Um, well, firstly, thank you very much for having me on, guys. It's been great. I've chatted to you both 
quite a lot anyway but nice to come on and finally be on a show that I watch quite a lot it's great and I love the work that you are both and the whole net the whole crew are putting in and it is definitely one of the highlights of my listen every week so thank you very much for having me on and if anyone does want to hear more of my voice um you can search my name fpl tips with a z on youtube and the same on twitter as well or if any of you youngsters are over on tiktok i'm on there as well i like the tiktok you've been doing some interesting stuff on there <laughs> interesting <laughs> what do you do on tiktok do you floss yeah no i don't i'm not dancing <laughs> no dance. as much as you might want to go and watch me dance here but it's you do, not that. you do like a floss and you'll be all by by Rudiger this week. <laughs> exactly, it's a different dance with my transfer targets each week. <laughs> I love it. Um, as a last thing as well, guys. So I'm gonna when I end the stream, we'll just say backstage to say bye as well, Hibo. Um, but sure. quickly for the kind of listeners, I just want to say if you've enjoyed the show, please do hit like, hit subscribe. If you're listening on podcast, um, it would be appreciated if you can leave a review on an Apple device. Um, we're obviously um kind of net that hall. I know that Mariner gets very upset because he's heard many people calling us net the hall. I've told him mm. to change the name to net the hall, but guys, finally the mutiny has begun. If you've listened till this late, send in, in the poll online tomorrow, whether it should be net that hall or should we rename to net the hall and mutiny Mariner's ship. But I'll leave mm. you with that thought guys. And it's out there in the public for the first time. And um, we'll see you backstage. Bye guys. <laughs>